This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Jumbo Jumbo and hello, hello everybody. A very warm welcome to a Sunrise Safari. We are in the Masimara of Kenya and we got some two Savocats right there. My name is David. Welcome aboard to your very own safari live from the African bush. I do not remember the last time I started a drive with a Savo cat, and not one. I got two here, which I think they could be a pair, a male and a female, and what a beautiful start. To a very cold morning of the Masimara of 16 degrees Celsius or 61 degrees Fahrenheit. And remember, we are coming to you live. We love to hear from you. Send, please, please send questions to us or comments to hashtag world earth on twitter or at fc in the comment section of the youtube channels for the young ones kids questions at world earth dot tv those are two several cuts there i would be very honest it's the very first time i have started a drive with a several cut two of them a male and a female and in the background they are you can see some impalas that give me lots of joy this morning and i'm trying to think we're gonna have wonderful stuff for much later in the day good morning everyone my name is david and on camera is bungay please stay with us because apart from uh, those several cats which have taken a long distance from where we are we've got some beautiful elephants here for you I think there's one baby, Bungay, if you look carefully to the left, that I think is having a bit of breakfast. Look at that. Small calf. Just stopped nursing, but very close to Mama. Look at the beautiful sunlight. Very good sunlight, just shining into the oil escapement in the background there. Oh, she's back to nothing again. Let's see. I'm sure you all know the mammary glands of elephants are always between the front legs. I'm not sure if this cow has some squint tusks. They'll always keep their babies very, very close to them, and especially closer to the mother than anybody else. Notice not much flapping of the ears, but still very cold. The ears start getting busy later in the day. Getting the best of the grass now, which also has lots of dew in it. We had some very good rains, the Masuimara. We initially thought we have the onset of the rains, the short rains, which is stopped for about five days. We didn't have any rains, and then they restarted yesterday. Brandon, you're asking if elephants have excellent hearing. I will tell you, hearing is one of their strongest senses. Once in a while, you might see them opening their ears just to focus and make sure they're getting it right. But their hearing is so accurate to me, if I'm asked between seeing and hearing, I would say elephants hear, hear better than sight. Their strength or the sense of hearing is quite, quite strong. Now on a closer look to that cow, see how her tusks are now. It's like one came out then under the trunk to the other side. Uh, to me, that's a genetical, you know, deformation. It happens a lot. 
sometimes we have also seen elephants with one tusk. Ladies and gentlemen, remember we have other live locations this morning from Africa. Well, from elephants in the Masai Mara to elephants at Juma in South Africa, as you can see, we've got a herd that's kind of spread out all over the place at the moment, which is quite nice. I'm quite glad that we managed to find them. It's one of my absolute favorite things to do on a bushwalk. And so I'm excited that we'll probably get to spend quite a bit of time with these guys as we follow them around on foot and try and get some really nice views from where we are at the moment. It's perfect because of the fact of where we are. All right, my name is Tristan on camera. I've got BK. And as I was saying, as we're perfectly situated here, we're on top of a really large mound. Um, it's first thing in the morning, so there's not a lot of wind that's blowing at this stage. And so these elephants are completely oblivious to the fact that we're sitting here watching them, which is exactly what the aim is when we're on these walks, is to try and view wildlife without any sort of disturbance whatsoever. And so if we can find high points where we can sit and we can watch, then we're able to kind of view them fairly safely. And termite mounds are one of the best, best things when you're looking for elephants or trying to view elephants on foot. The higher you can get, the safer it will be. And I think if we just patient and sit where we are, it looks like the whole herd is actually going to come right past where we're sitting right now. So this should be super cool. Um, like I said, one of my absolute favorite things to do. There is something incredibly serene and powerful at the same time about sitting in a herd of elephants on foot. You know, when you're in a car, you have that feeling of protection of this. I mean, it's obviously a, a vehicle that you can move away in, 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 in very, very quickly and you kind of feel safer, if that's the right word for it. Um, whereas on foot, you, you kind of hear every movement. You, you feel when they're breaking branches in a way. You, you kind of have a much greater sense of awareness of what the elephants are doing around you. Um, so it's an incredible feeling to be in amongst them. And like I said, if you position yourself correctly, often you can get these really nice kind of views of them. And, and like I say, they, they typically don't respond to you if, if you've done it in the right way, which is pretty cool. So hopefully what we're going to do, like I said, is we're going to kind of just trail them a little bit and we'll to keep trying to pop up onto termite mounds and view them. Um, hopefully it should work out quite nicely and I'm hoping that they're going to go to Gallagher Pan for a drink. So lots and lots to look forward to as we engage on our morning's walk. Good morning, everybody. And welcome to Anbion Pinda Private Game Reserve, where this morning Craig and I have found this lioness and her two very playful youngsters who are going to be in picture very shortly. My name's Matt, and behind the camera this morning we've got Craig. And just having a look at Mom here on the left, in the distance there are a couple of zebra we parked next to a watering hole here, are a couple of zebra making their way to this area. We haven't seen the rest of the pride who were all here last night, but the youngsters you can see now lying in the road are actually full of energy this morning. They've been running and jumping on one another, jumping on mom, stalking birds around this pan. They were stalking a woolly neck stalk earlier, but they're just, yeah, being really, really playful this morning. You can see that one in the road now, watched as two blacksmith lapwings landed in the distance. But very alert, these two, and, and I mean, very distracted by everything as well. There was a side-striped jackal that ran down in the dried-up watering hole off to our right, and they just watched by, and you can see how mom, where that youngster was looking now, mom was also quite focused on that area behind us. <clears throat> JP, you're asking how big this pride is. There are three older lionesses, two of which have youngsters, one of which is in the picture that you see with her two youngsters. Another one has three young male boys who are about 15 months old. And then the two dominant males. So there are nine members of this pride. Like a red bull quilly have just taken off behind us and made quite a noise that that one picture that you see now is, is watching. Uh, 
And I wonder where the rest of the pride ended up last night. There's signs of, of elephants all over the show from where they were originally, not too far from where we are now, in fact. And I can imagine they chased these lions. So it'll be interesting to see if, if we can't find where the rest of the pride ended up. So, lioness this morning. Wow, what a beauty. But then look what we have here in the Masai Mara. We have a breeding herd of buffaloes. They are quietly grazing on this lush, very green, not so much green grass. This area, it rained last night. So the grass is wet. So remember buffaloes, need water on a regular basis. So this is, will nourish them with water as they are grazing on. Because when they have calves like this, they tend to be in a very big group. So the number of buffaloes sometimes fluctuates depending on social or environmental factors. These buffaloes have small calves, so they need an extra number, which means there's protection from herbivores. These young ones are vulnerable to lions and hyenas. Remember, we're coming to you live. So for the young viewers out there, please talk to us through Kids Question at wildearth.tv, hashtag wildearth on, on the YouTube section at FC. We can see some very not so much of an activity. They're lazily grazing while walking towards the marsh. You can see some cattle egress there and also some sacred ibis. See the little ones have brown fur that helps them against predators because it blends in with this kind of vegetation. Now, at this time, sometimes you find that buffaloes are selective feeders. So they keep on moving to an area where it's less browsed or less uh, grazed. So because of the rain last night, the fresh shoots that, that came up will are so sweet and so will nourish them with some nutrients and also lots of water. You can see we have some big bulls leading and some t some big bulls on the edges while the cows are in in the middle of the herd protecting or keeping the, the calves near them. So th Daniel, thank you so much for your question. Uh, how much grass can a buffalo eat daily? Uh, not sure on the size, but I'll get back to you. But what I know is that buffaloes are bulk grazers, meaning that they eat lots and lots of grass in a day. So I'll get back to your question and really, really regret not knowing how much they can eat on a, in a day, but they have a very, very unique way because they have, we call them bulk grazers, meaning that they eat lots of grass. You can see that cattle egret riding on the back, hitchhiking, very slowly walking while eating some insects that are disturbed by the buffaloes. Very colorful morning, cattle egress enjoying, and the buffaloes walking in unison, going to the marsh. I think that our Ellie's are enjoying their own meal this morning. Um, it's been cool to watch them. They're all just kind of feeding in different places, and this is when you know elephant herds are kind of at their most relaxed when the herds 
splits out and everybody's in a different spot having a little bit of a feed um, it's when they're not really on a serious move but what they are going to be doing is that they are slowly kind of heading down towards nearby pan so it's going to be really cool we're going to try and get ahead of them just now and sit at the termite mound that's right next to the pan and we should get this really nice view of them coming down to drink um obviously it's going to take a little bit of time for that to happen because as i'm saying they're all feeding so each one is kind of walks a few steps then stops and starts to eat walks a little bit stops and starts to eat and so you know the, the time that it's going to take them to actually get to the water hole um Will, will be a while but it's so nice just to sit on foot with these guys and listen to them and it's this time of the day where we have this beautiful dawn chorus so we have all the birds singing we have the ellies feeding there's some wildebeest actually that's just to our left here that are walking around and so they grunting and groaning and it's just so nice to sit here and take it all in i think that's the one nice thing about being on a bushwalk is the ability to just listen and feel nature rather than just see it so Chantal, you're asking about how they're able to deal with thorn trees. So elephants are pretty clever creatures. They've got a, um, a system that they can use, which um, I've seen them do quite regularly, particularly with big thorn trees like acacias. So the acacias that have the big white thorns, what they do is they'll break the branch and then they run their trunk down this thorn tree. So basically imagine if this is the thorns like this. As the trunk comes, it squashes the thorn flat against the branch and then they keep doing that all the way. And then what they do is they take it and they feed it the opposite way. So those thorns all flatten down and with those big plate-like teeth, they're able just to crunch those thorns down and basically just eat them. Um, so that's one way that they deal with it. The other way is that they're actually quite delicate little feeders when they want to be. So if they've got a tree where the thorns all has spines, because spines are much harder um, versions of thorns in a way, um, they, with those, will actually just use the tip of their trunk just to pull the little leaf off and, and eat them like that. So it really depends on the thorns of the tree. If it's a small thorn, so something like a buffalo thorn, then they just shove it in and those big teeth are able to, to just mash all those thorns down before it does any damage. Um, they also have quite thick um, skin around the mouth and tongue. And so thorns aren't a real big issue for them because of it. Okay, well, we're going to stay with these guys. Like I say, we'll probably spend a lot of time with them this morning. It's just so magical to be a part of the herd. And so while we do that, I'm hoping that we're going to get a better view shortly. Welcome back, everybody, to Anbio and Pinda, where we still off big stretch from this lioness. And on the move again. And I wonder where exactly she's going to go. That area that she's walking towards, or maybe a little bit further back behind her, has a little bit more shelter. I want to get that youngster looking up at her underneath her. Heard something now that potentially sounded like the rest of the pride of lions. I was just having a quick look behind us, but I can't seem to see anything. She, She's been... Very fixed on that area all morning that she's currently steering into. And I wonder if maybe the rest of the, the lions from this pride set off in that direction last night. Because of where she is, here comes one of the youngsters. Let's see if it doesn't pounce on mom. No, you can hear Vildebeest in the background and now the zebra also very fixed on, on her as she walks away. Another big old stretch morning yoga, the downward dog. See, she had a little bit of water earlier. And one of the cubs is not... <laughs> Full of energy, these two, this morning. How stunning is that with their reflection? They've been so distracted by all the birds. There's another willy neck stalk on the left, left hand side that they're now stalking, but these two are super cute. They're just out of pictures, that willy neck stalk that they've been stalking all morning. <laughs> to no avail that they've, you can see they don't put in as much effort as they should be, but just practicing for one day when they're mom size and age to hopefully take down prey successfully themselves. Have a look, and then they'll just lie now and sit and <laughs> watch as the stork goes about looking for frogs and things like that. 
in this watering hole. Trevor, you're asking why lions hunt mostly at night. They are nocturnal animals, so that's when they are awake and that's when they go about their their business. Not to say that they don't hunt during the day, like you say, are mostly at night. This particular pride, often what well, I've seen them catch things in the early hours of the the morning, super early, first light, maybe after an unsuccessful evening, but that's when I've seen them hunt. How amazing is that picture with their reflection now and mom lying in the background? A couple of look like swallows flying over this watering hole. They're very, very distracted, this youngster. So have a look out. It's, it's heads all over the place, watching the birds, watching the stork. And now the stork has come to exactly where they were lying earlier. I think by the sun, time the sun creeps up over the mountains, they might move to a different spot. So I'm going to stick around and see where they end up this morning. happening in front of me here. We have had a busy morning. I will need some time to go through all of this with you, but we are sitting at the hyena den with Miss Hart and her two little ones. My name is Lauren. I do have Niels on camera and we were with Miss Tlalamba, but unfortunately for some reason there was absolutely no signal and I think the gremlins may be out in full force today along with the overcast weather. So gremlins general, wherever you are, please come and assist with getting rid of these awful gremlins. So we had to leave Miss Tlalamba, I'm afraid, and we're now sitting where I am the most happiest at the hyena den number two. Now it's overcast, but it's definitely not cold. 19 degrees Celsius, 66 degrees Fahrenheit here in Juma Private Game Reserve. And we have got a carcass. I believe it's an impala. And just to give you a recap on the events of last night for those who maybe are not updated. Falco, the serial killer of the Juma clan, he's a new immigrant male to the Juma clan, the newest actually, he killed an impala you on the dam cam. He seems to like to do it in full view. Listen to that squittering. <laughs> Lots of fighting between this pair. Oh, Corky's head. Corky's little one's just popped her head out. I'm not sure if you've got a view, Niels. Corky's with Miss Tlalamba. But yes, Falco made a kill, and apparently it was a pregnant ewe. And there was some angry elephants around, so he stashed it in the water of the pan, which hyenas are well known for that, stashing their kills in water, which to me sounds rather gross, but hyenas do it. And Miss Kalamba stole from the hyena. Yes, yeah, she did. She was getting revenge. And this just goes to show all the predators steal from each other. Every single one of them. It's not just hyenas stealing, I can assure you. So Tlalamba is in what the guides are calling Hosanna tree. She's up that jackalberry on the dam wall. And for some reason, we didn't have signal. I don't know what's going on in the realm of signal. Listen to that. <laughs> Well, that just shows you they've got the the full hoop. They're fighting for the the top nipple. This is a strive for. Oh, oh my goodness! Wow! Oh. 
Wow, I cannot believe that just happened. Times eating the meat. They start eating meat very early, but it's just nibbles. They stay in milk for 18 months. I cannot believe that level of aggression. To you. So if we just zoom into the cup's news, the one that's currently nibbling on the carcass is the darker one. I think this one is female and the other one is the one that I want to check. So we're going to sit here and watch the story unfold. How beautiful to see cubs. You know, cubs have a, have a long time before they become adults. And so I think the moms are doing a great job. So here in the Mara we have a topi. See, closely related to an antelope in the Southern African region called the Sesebi. Now this one here is also related to an antelope here called the Hatibist or Kongoni. These are one of the fastest antelopes that we have around here. Selective feeders. They graze around with zebras and sometimes wildebeest. Now, at a time like this, during the migration, we also have topis that migrate from Serengeti to the Masai Mara and back and forth. Now, this one has been, have been left behind. We have a few of them around here. So possibly they're hanging around that male because male topis will form territory where they'll attract females to come into their territory which is called a lake. Now topis, I guarantee you they have sharp eyes so when you're around topis just look at when they're staring and if topis are calm like this you definitely know sometimes they're not predators. So he keeps on stopping, taking a look and then gets back to grazing. Now, we call them the antelope with the blue jeans and yellow socks. As you look at the hind leg, they have a blue patch on the hind leg, and then the below or the, or the lower leg is ye a bit yellowish. So if you want to call them the antelope with the blue jeans and yellow socks, you're free to call them. Now, this one is rubbing his face onto the mud, onto the ground, because they rub sometimes their, their scent or they gland on their face on the, on the ground. Sometimes when other males encounter them, it's a way of showing aggression and they, sometimes they keep off. Claire, thank you for your question. How, may, how often do topis migrate? So topis will migrate uh, in the same time as the great migration where the wildebeest will migrate. So I would say twice in a year where they'll be here in the Mara and heading back to the Serengeti. So it's not so often, but only a few times in a year. But Heading back to south, as most of the antelopes or the wildebeest and zebras are heading back to the south in Serengeti, so they'll be walking down together. So not so often, but only about once or twice in a year that they will migrate. So still busy rubbing his scent gla um, facial glands on the ground. So I can say these are all males. So they've established a little territory. They will be here for a while. Seems like the grass today is wet and soft. So most of the herbivores are happy to enjoy the lush grass here. I'm 
gonna try and stay here as long as I can because as soon as Hart leaves, there's no adults, which means we have to leave. So we need to maximize this sighting. Look at this pair. My goodness. See, they're not really eating, Tamsin. They're just nibbling at this stage. Hyenas are such incredibly powerful animals because they stay in one of the most richest milks in the island. <laughs> Hello. We need to see your genitals. I know, slightly bizarre. Don't go all shy on us. Mm -hmm. But the reason they start eating meat really early, or at least nibbling it... Oh, I've got a bee flying around my microphone. I'm sure you can all hear it. ...is to get their tummies ready, get the immunity ready, get those digestive enzymes ready to process meat. Because remember, hyenas eat a lot of putrid carrion. It's not pleasant. Hello. <laughs> I miss you guys. So as soon as their genitals are flaccid, we shall zoom in. Because I really want to know. I'm convinced that the one on the left right now, the darker one, is a girl. But I really need to check. And any of you who are on the computer, get screenshotting for me. Because it's a lot easier to look at the screenshots when it's not moving. So you can all assist me in this. I think it's a boy and a girl, but oh, that's just my gut feeling at this stage. It's a bit of a process, learning the sex of the cubs. They don't stand still and give us very nice views for long. I'm not getting that name, I'm afraid, but hyena cubs stay in milk anywhere from 18 months to 24 months. So hyena mother definitely cannot give birth more than once per year because she's lactating for a very long time. It's a protracted lactation period and there's a lot of investment for the cubs. So definitely not more than once per year. Only really after two months will she start to come into, uh, two years, sorry, will she start to come into Ishtas again. Now, Corky, as I mentioned, is with Klalamba. I didn't see Ribbon there, but she could possibly be there. Look at you two. Your spots are starting to come through. Aren't they adorable? So we know that Ribbon's got two boys. I think that Corky's one is a girl. And this is the two that I really don't know. So my job for the next little while is to get genital checking. Welcome back, everybody. And just as we thought, where that mom was fixedly staring into have now emerged these three subadult male lions who moments ago were all having a lap of water and I'm just trying to see their, their faces to see if dark patches of red perhaps but they don't they all look relatively clean a couple of pictures in the tree behind them. I'm not sure if you can see them in the picture, there, but there are a couple of the three white back vultures dotted in the trees behind them. And I wonder if their mom wasn't successful last night with something small, or didn't catch something small. But I like to drink and, and have a bit of water. Although it's a little bit strange that their mom's not with them. See where they now looking is the direction where they came from. So I wonder if they probably would have eaten first if it was, if there was anything, but three growing boys to, to feed would have made short work of whatever it was. And maybe mom's just tucking into the last bits of whatever's left.
Julia, are you commenting on how gorgeous this light on these lines is this morning? It is phenomenal light, that golden hour, as they say, that first little bit of light that's crept up and over the mountain is exquisite. They, the reflections that are coming off this water, which is like glass this morning, mirroring their reflections was, was actually quite something. And these two are, well, the three of them are almost coming up to their second birthday. Let's give them a bit of a birthday shout out today, the 20th of September. But you can see they too, like those two youngsters that we were watching earlier, also quite distracted by the birds. This one on the left hand side now flicking its tail. Obviously got those biting flies that are irritating it. Maybe you see an ear twitch, but they might also snap at it like you saw it do now. Looks like it's going to be quite a nice day, not a cloud in the sky. So as soon as it starts heating up, they might venture back to where the, the area that they were in last night. A little bit more shady, a little bit more sheltered. But not a bad spot for them to hang around. Those zebra are still uh, underneath a scotia off in front of us to the left. Just keeping a watchful eye out on the slots who are lying out in the open now, but also probably just trying to warm up. Chilly evening with a little bit of a wind that came through. And there, those zebra that we are talking about next to that beautiful scotia tree. This time of year, they're all obviously flowering. You see those very red, distinct red flowers of, of the... And a bad, not a bad spot all those avid birders at home to, to sit and watch. There are all sorts of sunbirds. Sure, a, a lot of birds have seen uh, sociable weavers um, all drinking that sweet nectar from, from those flowers. You might see a lot of animals eat, or monkeys will, and baboons and the likes will also go pick them, and then other things will come and parlor, go and eat those when they fall off. This lot sounds like there's another vehicle joining us. You can see these three youngsters all staring at the newest arrivals here to come and view them this morning. I'm going to stick around and see if mom doesn't show her face. We are also just chilling at the moment, waiting for our Ellies to catch up with us. We've gone ahead of them a little bit, and so we're waiting. But what I thought I would do is just show you guys, you're asking about thorns and how elephants are able to cope with them. So this is the thorns of an acacia. Now, this particular branch is not very healthy, and so the, the thorns are not very pliable at this stage. But essentially what I was trying to explain is that an elephant will wrap its trunk around and apply pressure to the point where that happens. And like that like that, like that, and slowly they then are able to basically flatten everything. It's much easier if you've got a trunk because you can fold it all the way around. And then what they do is they feed the branch in this way. And so as they're eating, you can see these flattened thorns are no longer poking them. This is now kind of pliable and bent over. And so when the teeth crunch like this, it's not actually hurting them in any way, shape, or form. So it's a very clever system that they use in order to feed. Now, also what they will do is if they have these acacia branches, you look at these sort of smaller um, front end or terminal parts of the branch, the thorns up here are a lot softer. Um, and even though they, they are sharp towards the end, they almost bend. I don't know if you can see that. You can see how this one kind of bends rather than snaps. Um, and they're soft, so they'll often eat towards the edges of an acacia tree just to avoid having to deal with these very, very sharp, very hard thorns. Now, interestingly enough, when I took this particular branch, um, it had a passenger on it, and it had something that is incredibly camouflaged. Now, I don't know if you can see it there. It's what's called a tree hopper that is sitting on this particular branch, and the camouflage on it is absolutely astounding. Um, it's, it's a little bit out in the open at the moment, so you'll see it will move a little bit, so... I'll just rotate the branch with it. Um, but once it gets into the, the sort of area where 
the thorns come out, it camouflages super well. Now, these little guys basically will move up and down the branch and they will basically poke the branch um, and expose a hole and then suck sap from it. Um, so they're a little bit of a parasite to the, the plant itself. Um, but the camouflage is amazing and the structure of them is amazing. They always remind me of kind of aliens. And if you Google um, tree hoppers, you'll see there's some very elaborate uh, looking ones out there in the world. There's species all over the world that look quite cr crazy. All right, well, we're going to keep sitting here. The aliens, I can hear them. They're starting to come a little bit closer. Hopefully, they'll pop out shortly. Imagine the size of Ellie's compared to the size of this Jacko pups. Now, these are pups of the black backed Jackos, that are at times called the silver backed Jackos. And there are three of them. This is the den. And I think their mother must have brought them some kind of hide that they're trying to have for breakfast. We've got three species of jackals in East Africa. This one here, the black-backed jackal or the silver-backed jackal, we call it sometimes. We have the golden jackal and we've also got the side-striped jackal. Those are the three canines of these species of jackals here. And the females, after mating or after a gestation period of two months, they'll always give birth to anything between one to nine pups. Just trying to investigate what carcass this could be. Definitely can tell. There has some meat in it, that's why they're chewing it. But I think above all, they're also trying to sharpen their teeth. When time will come, we'll be able to chew. I think it's more of sharpening their teeth. And hopefully, it helps them a lot. This must be a very old hide of some sort. But either way, I'm sure they are getting something out of it. Remember, we are coming to you live from the Masimara. So beautiful to see a uh, Jaco Pups with such a wonderful light. And should you have any questions or comments, please send them through to hashtag World Earth on Twitter or at FC in the comment section of the YouTube chat channel. Jim, you're asking whether these ones are the same size as adult foxes. The adult foxes are more or less the same size, and that's a very, very good question, because we have what you call the bat-eared foxes here in Kenya, and they're more or less the same size. So what I'm trying to say, once they age, they grow older, Jim, these pups will be a lot bigger than the bat-eared fox. And uh, of the, the three species that we have of the jackals here, I think the golden jackals to me are big in size, as much as they have, you know, much taller or bigger fur than the other two types. But yes, Jim, you're right. This size is basically the size of the bat eared foxes. The only thing I would say is that the bat eared foxes have bigger ears than uh, the jackals. <laughs> so that one is a bit uh, crafty. It's trying to snatch the breakfast from the other two. Just wonderful to see these canines in such great light in the morning. And I'll spend them a few, I'll spend with them a few more minutes before I move on and maybe wait to see if the parents will come and bring them maybe much fresher food. Oh, the drama is not ending here. Now, Corky's little one, she is, imagine you are starving. You know that feeling when you're really hungry and your tummy's going Grrr. And the most delicious food that you can ever think of, whether it is a cheesy, garlicky, spicy pizza, or even just a big bar of chocolate in front of you. And 
everyone's eating it, but you don't have access to it. That's what's happening to Corky's little cub. It's hungry and it keeps running to go steal, but then it immediately retreats. No one's chasing it away. It chases itself away. And I say it, I shouldn't. It's definitely a girl. Corky's little one is a female. Niels and I have been doing some inspecting. You can see pseudo penis flat at the end, almost like a square tip rather than that pinched tip, which sounds rather bizarre. Corky's little one's a girl, which means it's great news for the clan, another female for the clan, but unfortunately it will be the lowest ranker. <laughs> it's hungry. It wants to go to that carcass. Nita, you're five years old and you are asking why are the cubs not pups? They're not part of the Kennedy family. They're not part of the dog family. So you don't call them pups. You call them cubs. And they are so dark when they're young. And once they get to about three months old, almost like the age of Hart's little ones now, you'll find that they start to develop their spot and they get lighter. So when the cubs are young, they need a lot of protection. So this is probably why they're darker, so that they can just blend and they stay in a den. They stay in a dark den. And although they're the most well-developed of all the predators, they've still got a lot of developing to do. Their muscles are weak. They've got sharp little teeth, but they still rely heavily on mom and they rely heavily of being stashed in the den. So it's only when they get bigger and stronger and they start eating meat, they start getting a lot more mobile, that you'll find that they start to lighten and their spots pop out. And you can see that they've actually got little spot patterns. No two hyenas will have the same spot pattern, which is actually how we identify them. But it's normally around the three month mark, give or take, that the spots will pop out and the hair will lighten. Corky's little one is growing slowly and that's because she wasn't born with the biggest silver spoon in her mouth, sadly. It's a nepotistic society and Corky's low ranked now. So this little one is low ranked. She will not get fed as frequently as the others, but the milk she will receive will still be in large quantities and it will still be extremely nutritious. Oh, okay, Corky's little one, we can get a view here. I'm gonna show you how we know it's female. Oh, we're gonna try. Yeah, uh, there we go. You see how it's completely flat at the end there. There's no pinched triangular sort of tip. That's how we know it's a female. Amy, you're asking, is it normal for the cubs to be born at similar times? Hyenas can act. Oh, that's very sweet. Oh, it's saying hello to heart. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> that was slightly naughty. Corky's little one is notorious for pulling the carcass right into the den and it, she learned it off of Ribbon's boys. It's a trick, it's a new technique. If you take it into the den, no one can eat it. You can hear the squittering. Tantrum, this is a tantrum, everyone. So yes, Amy, sorry. Hyenas can actually give birth all year round, but they do tend to all give birth at the same time. Why? Well, it means that there's a communal den, there's safety. All the cubs are stashed in one den. There's adults around. It's far more beneficial to give birth when there's other cubs and other mothers. Rather, oh, that's really sweet. That's really sweet. None of the cubs are aggressive to Corky's little one. They're aggressive in their twin litters, but not Corky's little one. So yes, it's very normal, Amy, for hyena clans to all give birth round about the same time. Now, hyenas are one of the most intelligent animals in the savannah. Back here in the Mara, we have a very beautiful bird of prey. It's called the Batilia eagle. 
Now, what's the meaning of Botilio? Botilio is a French word which means a street entertainer or a tightrope walker. Street entertainers who walk on the, on the ropes, they balance while placing their hands on both ends, trying to balance not to fall. So this bird has a very short tail. Can see that has a very beautiful face. Very, very beautiful. Now, this is one of my favorite birds. The reason why it's a favorite, this bird has a long time before it gets the full color plumage. Now, it takes about seven years for this bird to take or to get the full color plumage. Now, if the bird turns around, we'll see that it has a very pink or reddish bill. So the scientific name for this bird is called Teratopius equidatus. So Teratopius equidatus meaning so the teratopias means a beautiful face, equidatus meaning it doesn't have a tail. So when this bird flies, it flies like it's balancing, such a way like the meaning of the word batilua, like how the tightrope walker balances when they're walking on the rope. This is a very, very interesting bird. You can see the full color plumage. So. The difference between the males, you'll see that the males have the black, the dark marking, which is, the margin here is broad, while the females have a lesser or not as broad like the males. So that is how you differentiate when this bird is in flight. Now you can see the juvenile. So this juvenile is not yet on his color plumage. So it takes about seven years for these birds to get the full color plumage. So this bird is, is preening himself. After the rain, sometimes you find that most birds will warm up like the butt leg of warming up up on that tree. So until it's dry enough, that is when he'll be able to fly. But at the moment, he's still preening or cleaning himself. Good morning, good morning. It is a beautiful morning here in the Tswalu Kalahari. And we have a beautiful bird. My name is Moritz, guys. And as always, behind the camera, we've got David. Uh, but yeah, we've got this beautiful, pale, chanting goshawk this morning. One of the very few times that you actually, <laughs> that we actually come around the corner and he's sitting still. Um, just a stunning, stunning individual. Quite a, quite a, uh, I don't want to use the word common because I hate that word, but it is a regular sighting. But most of the time we do see them flying, you know, because they, they don't trust the vehicles so much. But a stunning medium-sized raptor that we have around here. Um, he's actually, he or she, is actually sitting relatively close to its nest at the moment. Um, we can't see whether they've got eggs in or whether the chicks have hatched or so but there you can see the little nest it is typical time for them to be breeding now and we don't know whether the other individual of this goshawk family might be sitting in the nest at the moment as you can see it's quite well camouflaged the nest but look at how beautiful that bird is stunning stunning a little far away now guys but typically you can see the so we had a question just from Liam what kind of food do these birds eat the pale chanting goshawk they typically um, their diet goes from uh, like small mammals um, little rodents those types of things they'll even go for around here those meerkats that we've been looking at so much lately um, so obviously also uh, the things like small 
um, little lizards, the barking geckos that we have around here. However, you they'll have to get lucky to to get the little barking gecko because they're mostly active only during the night. But yeah, so small uh, mammals, rodents like the little elephant shrews that we have around here, the meerkats also. Oh, guys, just remember they're not they're not rodents, but little field mice, those types of things. Also, they will go for little birds, maybe a uh, you know, Cape turtle dove or those types of things. Typically, you find them nesting relatively close to water or even find them just if their nest is not close to water. You find them sitting um, close to a water hole during the day to try and see if they can't nab something there. Um, but yeah, so predominantly they feed on small mammals. They'll even go for things like if the, when it gets to season for that um, small bat-eared foxes, those types of things. When they're adult uh, bat-eared foxes, they're a little bit too big, but definitely the baby ones they'll go for. So yeah, um, little field mice, meerkats, mongoose, those types of things, that's going to be their dominant source of food. Um, it's yeah, difficult to show you now how big it is exactly, but they sit about 55 centimeters high. Um, so almost two foot tall. So quite a big um, raptor for the medium-sized ones, but just beautiful, beautiful. I love these birds. And you quite often find them also in, like, when you when you do view them, you see them in pairs. Now it's not the case, but you will find them sitting, both of them, in a tree together or, you know, in close proximity to one another, um, maybe in different trees, and they... they I'm pretty sure they, they'll hunt together as well. But yeah, guys, so our plan this morning is to go and have a look at those baby cheetahs again. So we're going to move on and go and see if we can find them. Welcome back to Unbound Pinda, everybody, where very little has changed yet. Besides, for the fact that there are a couple of zebra making their way directly here, they are just a little bit further back behind the tree line. You can see this youngster hasn't noticed them just yet. The wind is, of course, not playing in their favour. It's blowing from the lions to us. But as those zebra slowly start making their way here, they stop start. Yeah, they come in the road these lions stick out like a sore thumb so I can only imagine that they'll see them from quite a distance, be upset that they can't come come down and drink and then venture off somewhere else this morning for a drink of water. But it will be interesting to see exactly how those pan, pans out. Those, I'm sure they could all do with some breakfast this morning but the only one who would really be able to take something as big as a zebra down is that mum of the two youngsters, who is probably not going to keep them out here. But if we zoom back in on this youngster that you we were earlier, two very sort of standout features of this young male lion are those massive paws of his and those spots on his back legs, which are an indication of his young age. But just the size of those paws, oh, they're huge. I mean, they're probably as big, if not bigger than the size of my hand. He, I think, has now noticed those zebra off in the distance or something in that. Yeah, there are a couple more zebra making their way here. Diane, you're asking how fast zebra can run. They can run at about 60 odd kilometers an hour. Now, just above this lion's head, if we pan out a little bit, you can see those zebra who have now noticed, <laughs> have now noticed these lions obstructing their way to the watering hole this morning. Everyone's now fixed on them. 
can see that white back falter in the distance who made me think that these lions were here and were successful sometime during the evening. Although we drove around and we couldn't find anything, but the zebra now on, are not looking at these youngsters. Maybe the mom of the three young boys is still back there. Like I said, I don't, I don't know where she was, but that's where the three of them came from. See, it's got their attention. They're all up and now turning away towards them. There's another vehicle coming to have a look at what the, these lines are up to. All looking at, at them at the moment. I was going to have a look with the binoculars to see if I can't find what the zebra are looking at. In the distance, I think they just a little bit anyway here at the watching hole no he's not going to come and drink here this morning because of these lions but now that it's starting to heat up but now that they it's starting to warm up maybe the lions move away and then it will give them an opportunity to to drink And you never know, I mean, that one on the right, you can see its body language is now pricked down. What you'd want to call stalking mode for a lion could potentially be good practice for, for them if they were to sort of maneuver around and try to chase these zebra towards one another. And who knows, maybe if there's a young one in the herd, they have a little bit of luck. The goings on at the stain right now are absolutely hilarious. <laughs> and poor Gorky's little one keeps getting chased by heart. And watch, watch, watch. She's going, she's going, she's going to try and steal. Mm -hmm. I'm pretending I'm not, but I am. I'm going to have a sniff up heart's bottom. Lovely. And then I'm going to run away. Too much excitement, you can't handle it. You can smell the milk. Oh, oh, that's not your mama, dear. That's not your mum. <laughs> they don't aloe sickle. It's not like lions. But you will find the lowest ranking of all female females may allow the highest ranking cubs to suckle from her. But Corky's little one is desperate for some of that carcass. <laughs> but Hart's pair are really gentle with it. Really not aggressive. The only aggression that we're seeing is in the twin litters. And I'm still trying to get a grip on the gender of Hart's cubs, and I've not got lucky. And I'm worried that the minute Hart leaves, this magical sighting is over. Can you just repeat that one more time, Gwen? Gremlins General, your name is getting shortened these days. Did you fight away the gremlins for me? I believe that you did. Thank you, Gremlins General. It's always a pleasure when you're on board. You are asking, do hyenas have milk teeth? And yes, they do. Most mammals actually do. Not all, but most, most carnivores, shall we say, do have milk teeth. And hyenas are actually born with their canines fully erupted. Out of all the carnivores, this is really quite unusual. And their jaws don't fully spring into action until two years old. So when we see them nibbling on the carcasses like that, it really is just nibbling. I think that's the perfect term. They're not fully eating. They are...
you see what's happening here? The dark, I can't actually believe this. The darker one on the left now is the more dominant one. That's the female. That's definitely the more dominant one, and yet it's darker. And Hart's scolding. You see that? She's scolding. For a first time mom, this is quite impressive. Hart can barely sit down, her belly's too full. <laughs> This aggression that we're seeing is normal. What's actually... Oh, dear. <laughs> Hyenas never fail to uh, put you in those awkward spots. Please don't drink your mum's urine. <laughs> and now she's going to lie in it. What's unusual is the lack of aggression between Ribbon's cups. Ribbon's boys were remarkably non-aggressive. Did you see that act of dominance? The tail was up from that cup. Act and dominant over Corky's little one. I don't quite know what Corky's little one is doing here. Immediately that showed you, what that showed you with that act of dominance, with the tail up and the aggression, we already know this, but what it does show us is that Hart's cubs are more dominant than Corky's cub, and that never used to be the case, everyone, Corky used to be the top. So again, just sort of proves that point, hammers at home, that Hart's cubs are higher up on that proverbial ladder, if you like, than Corky's little one. So I wonder if the darker one of hearts is a female, I just wonder what the other one is, is. I wonder if it is male. Or is it two females? That's what I can't decide. Sometimes depending on the angle, the pseudo penis can look slightly pinched at the top, but it's actually not. Hyenas really don't make it easy, do they? Yeah, it's highly entertaining. You wonder why I love to come to the hyena den. You learn so much just by sitting here. It's so entertaining. The cubs are just uh, unbelievable bundles of joy and energy, non-stop. I do feel slightly sorry for Corky's little one. It's just watching, it's hungry. So hopefully Hart's not going to go anywhere because as long as she's here, we can stay. Welcome back everybody to Unbound Panda where the stalk is on. A zebra, I think the first has gotten the better of them. They're now heading straight for the water. Have a look at this one, now having a bit of a reshuffle getting ready to pounce those back legs, just ready to open up the taps and try chase. And you might just see a chase here. I don't think it's going to be successful, but you know, it's maybe, have a look at that stalking now. But they're lying literally out in the middle of the open. Also, maybe inexperience here, not using any cover. But the mom and the two youngsters just off to the right are not interested in the zebra at all. But this, these three youngsters definitely in hunt mode now. And maybe if they do chase, I mean, they try and chase when the gap between them and the zebra is as short as anything. There's another vehicle coming to have a look at what's going on. Maybe now drawing the attention of the zebra to the lines with the noise of the engine. Yep, there the zebra have now sounded the alarm. Now they might change their body language, they'll sit up there, the one stood up now, not too fast, they know 
it's game over. Might just try anyway. See if they don't have any luck, but <laughs> those zebras certainly no match for these youngsters. Although those zebra are not going to stick around, they'll head for the hills. But have a look at how almost instinctively this one on the left hand side does a little bit of a wider loop around. Perhaps if they chase. <laughs> A comedy of errors out here this morning. It just looks like they're hurting these zebra now. <laughs> and the zebra will just keep running. Yeah, determination is, is key here for these young males, but I, I don't think they'll ever catch one of those ever this morning. Far too clever for them. They've just outsmarted them by running away. Not that those lines are, I think, trying their best. And just pure experience, yeah. Having a look now again at this lioness with lying with her two little youngsters. She hasn't moved. She's, she sat up the entire time those males were doing their thing, probably having a good laugh to herself. And now that you can see now that mom, she's not faced at all. Not the right opportunity, she's just enjoying this morning, but of sun getting warm, in and out of consciousness. Now that her heart is quite happy, she's had a good laugh at these three young boys. She knows how it's done and that def it's definitely not how it's done out here. That young male keeps looking back at her as if to say, like, why didn't you help us? Now, back at the zebra, back at the lioness. <laughs> but let's see, now that they're up and moving, they might disappear into a little bit more of a more shady, sheltered spot for the day. Well, if those lions are not very lucky with the zebras, they can try ostriches because lions will very comfortably uh, hunt ostriches as prey, if need be. I've got a male here and two females. And not sure it's a female, or rather a male I saw yesterday and the two females here. And if it's one, then I would guess the breeding plumage of him has improved a little bit <clears throat> and maybe more uh, hormones, testosterone hormones have gone a bit no, a notch higher because he was not as pink as he is. Look at that one female there. Wings dropped. A little bit of a dance. And this is in a clever way trying to coat the male. He has a choice of these two females, but most likely between the two, one of them could be the dominant hen. But I think currently is time to eat as ostriches are omnivores. And I'm imagining they're enjoying lots of seeds or grass blades or leaves of certain plants at the moment before the actual courtship happens but interestingly apart from that one male there just to cross a lager here we got another male and to me also he is showing signs of mating because when you see his legs and neck they are also pink but not as the other one and I guess that's why, <clears throat> excuse me, he's not very close uh, to those females. And there's a pecking order when it comes to mating among us ostriches.
And I, I am very happy to hear some of you, you are seeing ostriches for the first time on camera, which is pretty good news. And also don't forget, should you have any questions or comments on the same, please send, it, send them through to hashtag World Earth on Twitter or at FC in the comment section of the YouTube chat channels. We'd be happy to talk to you on this species of birds that you're seeing for the first time. And I'm sure you know they are the largest birds we got here in Africa. Heavy birds. And they do not fly. But they fly low. Or rather what I'm trying to say, they're very fast in speed, just like a small car. 70 kilometers an hour for them. Phew. And then, of course, that is when they've been cornered by predators. The first thing the ostriches will do, if threatened, is to lie flat in the grass or in the ground and try and conceal themselves from the predators. The biggest concerns apparently here in the Masai Mara are cheetahs. Pomo Khalid, you're asking how long the courtship here will go for. It takes anything from a week to about a month, depending on when the actual meeting takes place. And once it takes place, they may separate and go different ways. And sometimes you get the male on his own and the females on their own. Now, when the females go on their own, you'll get the dominant hen will be in charge of the flock. But having seen the other male there, should there be a concern between this male and the other one, we have seen them sometimes going for each other, and sometimes males will fight over mating rights for the females. But apparently, I haven't seen or, you know, heard of females fighting for the males. But the males, once in a while, will do that. You'll never mix or confuse the females from males when you were looking at ostriches. And I would imagine after the courtship is done and the mating is done, I'd be very happy to see the chicks of these ostriches one day as I just let them enjoy their foraging and feeding. Now, ostrich are very, very unique animals and one of the biggest birds that we have. Look at what we have here. We have a pair of crested crane or the Ugandan crane protecting or walking closely as they watch their chicks feed. Now, these birds will feed on invertebrates or vertebrates and sometimes they pick on the grass, especially now that it's rained yesterday so they're busily or neatly picking on the grass see they keep a, a very keen watch because the chicks are vulnerable to jackals hyena and sometimes even leopards now cranes are very very unique such that they have a very distinctive call you know it's it's reckoned that <clears throat> they have something that like an amplifier in their voice box or the trachea that when they call it amplifies and that is why a pair can be able to recognize each other for example if the male tends to walk away from the female then the call will definitely be re recognized by either of the, both now these birds are almost threatened because farmers have been having problems with these birds but here in the wild we have a very very unique or it's very very keen and interesting to watch them as they feed you tend to see that they pick on the fresh shoots that come up that is the reason why they become a menace to farmers now the international union for the conservation of nature has placed them from near threatened to endangered because their numbers have gone down. 
It's not often that we see these cranes out here. We only see a few numbers, but when you see chicks like this, I'll be happy to see them grow into maturity as the numbers going down. So in the near future, we have two that will add up to the population. Now, the mom or the dad are keenly watching because they are next to the road. Lisa, thank you for your question. Yes, this pair will be in a pair for, for quite a long time. Not known that they can pair eventually for life, but sometimes you see uh, cranes to be solitary, but not so often that they pair for life. But when they when they are doing parenting, then that is when they associate themselves and be in in such a pair. But there's so many birds that are known to pair for life, not really that the cranes pair for life. You can see the white flowers there. We call them the tissue paper flowers. See, the cray is watching again. Being on the road is, not, is a vulnerable place to be, as the chicks are not yet very, very well adopted to this kind of environment. So mom and dad will take them or have them to safety. Like there's a car approaching, see the mom and the dad leading the chicks? That is how parental care is so instinctively important to this kind of bird. The squittering is still ongoing. sorts of vocalizations from Hart's pair and Corky's one. They're still not giving me what I want though in the form of a gender check, but we'll get there. If wildlife teaches you anything, it teaches you patience. And it always pays off. Now, I don't think this impala is the same one that Foku killed and Kalamba stole, because that's still very much hoisted in the Hosanna tree, as everyone's calling it. Hosanna was always in that tree. He was always on the damn cam. I'm still convinced he knew there was a camera there. And this has to be a separate kill. Whether it was hunted by a hyena or scavenged, I don't know. But from the sort of look of the legs, it's another impala. Sarah, you're asking about hyenas drinking water. And just like leopards, they're actually not completely... They don't need to drink water every single day. And it really depends on what they're eating. The noise is incredible. Most of the carnivores get hydration from their kill from the blood so if they're eating a lot of meat they will sort of be more hydrated so they do drink we see them go to drinks and normally when it's been a really hot day they will drink every single day but they don't have to but as for the sort of volume if that's what you're asking i'm really not sure
<laughs> Here she comes. Niels and I are not going to go anywhere. We're going to sit and enjoy all this fun. Right, stay right there. Don't go anywhere. Because I initially thought I'm going to stay with the ostriches. But from where I was, I had lots of these eagles calling and calling and calling and I thought it's long since I saw an African fish eagle. Look at that. Of all the eagles of Africa, to me, these are very, very striking raptors and I would hope all of you will agree with me. Very colorful large in size and they remind me of the American bald eagle very good camera work there Bungay always you'll see them very close to waters any water be it a river a stream a lake, of course, because of their diet. Now, I'm just guessing we could be having a male and a female here. Not very sure. Richard Free, you're saying majestic eagle spear. And yes, they're very majestic, and when you look at all the raptors, it's, I would say, these eagles that will give you great views, and when the light is good like this, you'll keep enjoying watching them. So just saying, it could be a male and a female, and maybe the one on top could be the female, but generally the females of the African fish eagles are bigger in size than the males, as it would happen to many eagles, including the crown eagles, the martial eagles. The females are always a little, little heavier also. Below them, there's a little stream, and maybe they could be looking for fish. But apart from fish, you'll be surprised. These eagles here are very courageous. We have seen them looking at stocks, for example, the marabou stocks or sandobili stock feeding and once these stocks catch something for themselves they just fly down push them out and steal their prey of course mainly their diet is fish but they have also been known to feed on smaller prey like other ducks ducks in the water they've been known to catch flamingos terrapins and you'd be surprised also when it's possible, they also catch baby crocodiles. Can you believe that? They're strong. And if you look at their toes, their toes got uh, some tufts or some like bulbs so that when they fly in the water to catch fish, which sometimes is very slippery, the bulbs are just able to hook the fish or whatever they catch in the water and they just lock it in. It doesn't slip out of their feet fly back to a place like where they are and feed or devour their prey. I love when they call because when they call it's always like a duet, a male and a female. Beautiful African fish eagles and I think I will be uh, moving on. Welcome back, everybody, to Enmion Panda. We, if we have a look on our right hand side, there's a little bit of begging going on. These two youngsters have been suckling moms, just sat up. Obviously, those teeth are becoming a little bit too much for her, and she, she stopped, she sat up, but then the cubs 
might happen again. You can see they're trying their luck a little bit more now to have a little bit of a, a suckle of milk. But mom's had enough. She's up and she, I think, is going to walk away now. And they'll do that up until about six months. These youngsters are about four or five months old. So in the next couple of months, a month or two, they'll probably just be eating meat. But if you listen carefully, no, they stop now, but you can actually hear them. They beg, they moan and groan, and, and hopefully mom gives, caves in and lies down so that they can suckle, but she's... I think had enough now. Warming up quite a bit. One of those other sold out males has disappeared. I think these three are also going to disappear. It's a little bit more of a sheltered area this morning. Now that it is warming up already significantly this morning, half past seven. And we've sat with these lines for the most part of the morning. Now it's starting to heat up quite a bit. We've taken our jackets off but maybe just for now a couple of quarries and things like that that are still around in this open air provide a little bit of shade they might end up just lying down there exactly in a, in a spot of shade until the heat of the day a little later on this afternoon where they disappear completely maybe closer to the mountains or where they were last night into one of those drainage lines a lot of birds have started coming coming down to the water this morning for a bit of a drink. We've seen African quail finch, uh, wattle lapwings, all that, at least the youngsters, and those three summer old males keep watching. A little bit of grooming going on that you see there. And they straight back those youngsters to go and suckle from mom. Very tolerant of it, I must be honest, this mom. She was lying where she was earlier, just as you came to us, you would have seen she stood up, she was lying there and they were suckling for a, for quite a while before she eventually stood up and now again letting the youngsters have have their full. Quite a bit of grooming. Maybe you're asking when these lions will learn to be effective hunters. Sure, at this age that you can see there, four or five months old, it's just a case of watching and, and learning from the, the older lionesses and the, their mom to see you know, how it's done, where they go, what they do. But I'd say at least about a year and a half to two years before they can effectively hunt themselves when they're about 18 months, two years old, if not maybe a little bit older than that. And you saw how those young males at around 15 to 18 months have, they, they just set off in the general direction of those zebra with no sort of real intent of, of hunting just to see if they couldn't catch one for a laugh. But that's exactly what that was. It was a laugh for them. It wasn't serious at all. So yeah, I'd say when they get to about two, two and a half years old is when they'll be really effective hunters. And for now they've got it relatively easy. Mom will go out, the two youngsters in picture, mom will go out and do all the hunting. They'll start eating meat already, but mom still producing milk for them, so relatively easy for them to just go and suckle from, from her. But coming back to it, for those young males to be effective, and they're going to have to be when they become nomadic in the next couple of months and they're stuck in their, their own devices for the foreseeable future, at least about two years, they'll have to hunt quite often to keep themselves alive. It's such a hard time for lions to be able to fend for themselves, especially when they're ousted out of their territory. Now here we have a long crested eagle talking about the home range and area. So these raptors cover a big wide home range. 
and that will be home for about a year. And sometimes the territory will be attract. The only raptors that are allowed there are almost the same species, but preferably females. Now, earlier on we had a butler eagle who was roosting up in a tree. Now we have the long-crested eagle who is busy looking for grass mice and also grass rats and some invertebrates and even snakes that may be crawling and walking right now at this time of the day. It rained yesterday, so it's kind of like a fresh morning for some of the vertebrates and invertebrates to be strolling around. The reason why these raptors keep on sentinel at the, on this kind of tree. Now, this is one of the most recognized raptors because of the crest that hangs on the head. Very, very beautiful and unique bird. Now, these home ranges that they cover will only sometimes be temporary home for a year. And depending on availability of food, water, and even mating, they tend to maybe extend the home range, but they keep on changing from one home range to another. Now, this bird is seated or roosted up on a shepherd's tree. A very, very good indicator of sometimes this shepherd trees host a variety of indeed a cool looking bird thank you so much off he almost i almost said almost off he goes change position actually i think this other side where we are facing didn't seem like there's something anything much going on but I think he's turned around to check for will be prey or food. Now these birds have a very um, very good eyesight. They can locate prey from a long distance. So he keep on flying from one tree to another. So he keep on changing position from one tree to another as he looks for food to eat. Long-crested eagles are beautiful. I managed to see one on Juma once. It's very rare for this area, but they're really common in the Masai Mara, of course. Kisses. <laughs> oh, oh, we got a genital, we got a genital. Okay, that was a bit too brief. If anyone managed to screenshot that, do send it hashtag Wild Earth. Now, regarding the teeth, because um, I think it was you, Gremlins General, were asking about the milk teeth. They can also be called deciduous teeth when you're referring to them in animals. And with hyenas specifically, the milk teeth are very slender in form and they're not very robust, if that makes sense. And that they don't have um, specializations either. So they don't have, you know, how you can get teeth that are incisors and canines, molars and premolars. They're not specialized. They're just sort of small, sharp, slender, pointy teeth. And that is, of course, because they suckle during the denning period and the adults really rarely provision them with food this is quite rare and to be honest there's not much left on this carcass so their their milk teeth their deciduous teeth don't have to be specialized or robust at this stage imagine if they were i think it would be rather painful for mother ouch okay hello you come to see us now well that's lovely okay niels do your thing I think this is the best chance we've had all morning to get some views. <laughs> no, they're not completely flaccid. The 
this is the longest sighting that I've had at the den in quite some time and I'm enjoying every single moment of it. You're in Dume. In Dume. Lauren with hyenas. When Lauren was in the Mara, it was Lauren with cheetahs. But again, I think she has now more passion for the hyenas, which are good predators uh, to deal with. Well, I think I've changed my gears now to budding and budding from ostriches to the African fish eagle and now to another bird of prey. And I'm sure you all know who this is. And this is the bat lua, the bat clear eagle. But I got a question for you. Do you think it is a male or a female? Answers to hashtag Wall Earth on Twitter or at comments, what have seen the comment section of the YouTube chat channel. Who do you think it is? A male or a female of the Batloa? When you see these eagles flying in the air, compare them to the African fish eagles we saw earlier. Let's have a quick link to somewhere else. So I'll be happy to know who do you think this is, a male or a female? Indigo girl, you're saying a female, a female. I'll hold on to that. I'm not going to say yes or no. Let's look at it carefully, because I could also be wrong. Apparently, when they do not have the full plumage of adults, sometimes, even for us, they confuse us. But once they're fully grown, Linma, you're saying a male, and if I'm wrong, then you'll forgive me. But I also would want to go with Linma because I'm thinking it is a male. I'm getting very convinced this is a male because the female will have the white, and there's a break of the white uh, with a black band uh, for the females. So I would say it's to me more of a male than the female. Hopefully, the other partner may come here, and if that happens, then be lucky to see both of them. Butler eagles. I was saying earlier, when you see them in flight, these ones tend to glide a lot, just like the vultures, unlike the African fish eagles. Dominion, good question. You're asking whether egos are territorial against other ego species. Now, you may see this pair here, of course, if the female is around of the bachelor ego. If any other pair of the same species come here, they'll definitely have a fight and they'll go for each other. But you might see territories being overlapped by different eagles but not the same species so you might see martial eagles for example living around here or the long crested eagle living around here but not the same species of eagles in the same area i'm just wondering if you could get a male come around here or rather a female and you could see the difference between the two Hold on, right there, Bunge. You want to get something here? Yeah. <clears throat> Hopefully, she doesn't fly away. We're going to have a look at my book here. I want to show you the difference between both sexes and then maybe we'll agree. Now, we're going to look here. What I'm pointing at, that one there is the female. And you can see the white there and here. And this is the black band I was saying, breaks this white and this white. The primaries and the secondaries. And when we look up here, 
this is the male, and you can see what we're seeing in it. It's this dirty white here, and that is the male, and this is the bottom here. This is the male here, and this is the female. But also in flight, when you look them at, at them carefully, you'll see the female. You have this chestnut here, and the male will have all white on the back, but that is when they're in flight. All right. Good to go and look for something else, either more birds or maybe if I'm lucky, some lions. Good. If you don't see sometimes the big animals, it's always good to play with birds, and especially mornings like this one. Now, building on the teeth topic, or the topic of teeth, the sort of de total dental formula for hyenas is 34 teeth and they are specialized when they're adults, when it's a permanent teeth. Now humans only have 32, and leopards only have 32. So hyenas do have more teeth, be it only two, but it still assists them in being the bone crushers that they are. Now, if you think about it, if we maybe crunch through a piece of candy or really hard apple, sometimes you really feel that, the impact on your teeth. You can imagine the power of not only the sort of jaws, but the muscular power behind it to actually crunch through bone. Now, the stomach acid of a hyena is so acidic, it's so low on that pH scale, so it just blasts anything that comes into the tummy, and that's how they're able to swallow so much bone, even in shards. If we swallowed bone, it would probably get caught and stuff stuck in our esophagus and our tummy and the lining but hyenas are able to crunch through an entire carcass which is really incredible now i haven't seen june in a few days and june as you know is the one that i want to keep up with and i've had many requests from you all personal requests to sort of outline the clan and the family tree now there is a fantastic facebook page but i'm going to do that for you all as it stands at the moment we have really finalized the sort of hierarchy of the females and i'm going to map it all out for you and along with photos and the cups Give me a few days to do that and I shall post it online and you'll be able to see where everyone sits in this wonderful hierarchy. Oh, Niels is on point, but sadly it's not extended. We need it to be extended. Andrea, you're asking, will hyenas protect their food? Was that correct? Yes, of course they'll protect the food. Yes, any carnivore really would um, as much as they can. So obviously if Klalamba rocked up here now, which she will not, I believe she's Lala, which means sleeping. And yes, heart would absolutely chase her away. They would protect the food, although I really don't think there's much left of this carcass, to be honest. Hyenas are notorious for really not being scared. I think hyenas would only really run from a pride of lions. A hyena like Hart, a big female, would have absolutely no issue or no fear of Klalamba, a small, petite female leopard coming here. <laughs> I can't believe Hart kept these two bundles of joy hidden from us. <laughs> They're older than Corky. <laughs> Hearts like, oh, this is what motherhood is all about. Not as fun as they all told me it would be. <laughs> We're gonna sit tight and enjoy these tender moments between mother and cubs. So 
Alrighty, guys, my heart almost stopped this morning. We got to where the mom had the cubs the previous day, and as we drove in, we saw two jackals sniffing around just where she had them. So immediately I expected a little bit of a commotion, but luckily I feel like mom was present during this whole thing and she has moved them. All three cubs still looking good and well. They are in a bit of a tough spot at the moment. I think it was maybe a long night for them. But the cubbies are already starting to move around. So, you know, they, they're at that point now where every day is an adventure for them exploring and wanting to see what's going on and all of those things so mom is lying there just to the left or to the right of that green tree that you can see now with the white bark just over there somewhere she's lying you can just see her moving her head on the top right corner of your screen now so what we're going to do is we're going to stick with them for a little bit and see if these cubs now that because with the sun coming out now the the jackals would have moved off they're going to try and find a spot to rest in for the day. And that will cause the cubs to relax completely. So maybe start playing, come out into the open, and then we can show it to you guys properly. But just very happy that all three of them made it through the night. You know, it is unfortunately the challenges of the bush. So I'm hoping that they will come out and they'll show themselves to you and to myself and you know engage in a little bit of playing they are at that point now where they're moving quite freely so i don't think we're very far away from them actually traveling with mom and you know her not having den sites anymore um however when they if we do get them a little bit more in the open you'll see when they run and so on, when it gets to a little bit faster than walking, they are still a little clumsy. So I'd say maybe another week or two before they start operating with mom and she'll only leave them in a shrub when she goes off to hunt. But the rest of the time they'll they'll stick with her. But very, very, very happy <laughs> to have found them again and that everyone is looking in good condition. Unfortunately, for little cubs like that when mom's not around there is quite a lot of dangers in the bush snakes and jackals and ach you name it anything larger than them for that matter so this first stage of their life is critical for them to have a good hiding spot constantly something that is not quite the elephants that we were looking at earlier, but one that was alive many, many years ago. Um, so it's still obviously an elephant skull. You can just say by the size of it more than anything else is an eddy. Um, this is quite an old elephant skull. This was a male elephant that was killed by another male. Um, it was in 2018, I think, is when it was killed, if I remember correctly. Um, and so since then, it's kind of um, been in the sun and so it's slowly starting to break down a little bit and, and you can start to see the cracks and expansion that's taking place when it gets wet and then heated and wet and heated and much like rocks as they weather so the skull is weathering too. But it gives us a really nice chance to look at things on these ellies. Um, a lot of the time we talk about certain things with elephant and we, and we it's difficult to explain the anatomy without being able to kind of actually see the skull. Now, often we talk about age of elephants, and we talk about how as elephants get older, what you're looking for is the sunken in temples. So that's this area here. As they start to get older, the muscle structure within this section here starts to wither, and so the skin starts to drop into this big hollow that you see in this area. So that's one way of aging an elephant is when you start to see that coming down. The other way would obviously be to look at the teeth. Um, so if you have a look at the teeth at the bottom here, there they are. 
on those teeth on this particular individual um, are not that badly worn. And the reason why they're not badly worn is, like I said, this was quite a young bull. Um, his teeth were still quite large. Um, but what you can see is what's happened, unfortunately, is the, the teeth that were coming forward, which would have been in this cavity over here, have fallen out over time and, and kind of dropped out. Um, so they're not there anymore. But you used to be able to see the teeth in this section. And you could see how they start to come down. And you can notice, look how long they are when they start to emerge. So very, very long. And by the time they start to be pushed out the front, you can see how short that tooth has become. And so that's just the lifespan of the tooth. As it gets moved forward slowly, um, you'll find that they start to shorten and get a little bit smaller and eventually then pushed out the front. And basically in terms of sets of teeth, this area here is one set and this one where you see there's like a little break in this would have been another set that would have been in the front and then there would have been a set in the back here so you can tell the age again by just looking at number of sets that are still around um, that helps you um, helps you to be able to kind of work out an age especially if you find a skull now a lot of you think this is very cool um, it is a very cool thing to see the other amazing part about elephant skulls that a lot of people don't kind of know about them is how they are actually constructed so if I turn the skull slightly and lift it for you you'll notice here in the front where it's weathered and cracked you can actually see the honeycomb effect of the skull it's pretty amazing to see See how it's structured. So what you've got is you've got huge gaps um, that is kind of connected by thin bits of bone. And the reason for that is because if you imagine how big this is, you could imagine how heavy it would be if it was solid bone. Um, it needs to have the structure in order to be light enough for the elephant to actually carry it around every single day. Um, it would be a major, major problem if this was solid bone. In fact, the elephant would constantly feel as though it's kind of being pulled forward. So it has to have a structure that is lighter. And so that's why there's a honeycomb effect because it's light, but it's also incredibly strong. These little bone connections in between keeps it strong so that if they headbutt each other when they're fighting, particularly the males, they're going to be okay. They're going to actually crack each other's skull and kill each other. The other nice thing that we can see from this is you can actually see how the sort of trunk and, and tusk structure works. Um, in elephants, a lot of people get a little bit confused as to where everything kind of sits. So basically what you have is this section here, this opening. This is where the trunk will extend into, and then it folds over here and down this way. Um, and basically, that's where water and kind of air is being passed through. You can actually see if I twist the skull a little bit up for you, because you should be able to get a clear view of how that goes down through the skull and will go down into the mouth and then obviously down towards the stomach area, um, or lungs actually, more than anything else. Um, and so what they do is actually when the elephant is alive is that there is a membrane that sits across here. And so when they suck up water and it gets to this point, that membrane is shutting. So water is actually not going down into the lung area. They then will push it back down and into the mouth, which would have been obviously underneath this whole bony section. So if we turn it back, then you'll be able to see kind of where the mouth would have been. And so there's a separation between the lungs and the mouth, and that's how they don't get water in their mouth. Now you'll also notice this is where the tusks were. So there's a huge kind of cavity that's inside here um, for where the tusks would have been kind of hidden. Um, and you can see how deep that goes. So often we talk about tusks and how big they are. Um, what we see on the outside is just a small portion of what actually goes inside here. I mean, you can see the tusk would have ended up somewhere close to where the trunk starts, um, going all the way in and then eventually kind of came out over there. And this has been damaged by hyenas eating on it, um, so it's a lot shorter than it actually is. You can also add a bit of flesh onto that as well. And the other thing is, is where a lot of you might be wondering where the eyes would be. So the eyes would be in this socket here. You can see this little eye ridge. So that's where the eyes um, of an elephant sits. Um, and then the ears would have come off to the side. So it's really cool to kind of see the anatomy a little bit more in depth. Um, a lot of people kind of often are a little confused as to where everything goes. But this will eventually break down and it'll be completely destroyed and there'll be nothing left of it in a few years' time. Um, just little pieces and every time it rains, it'll, like I say, it'll expand and crack and whittle away and hyenas will chew on it and various other things will kind of utilize this particular skull.
So, Natalie, it really depends on the, the elephant. Every single elephant is different. Like, um, different size males that you'll get. Um, so, it's it's really dependent on, on the Ellie. But what is um, amazing with elephants, about 60% of their body weight sits over their front leg. So, you just have to work out, you know, how heavy each individual is. But, I mean, let's take... Let's take a really large bull that weighs six tons. Um, it's a serious amount of weight. Obviously, a lot of that is in in the um, the tusks and the teeth. Those being dense and the most solid. Um, you know, there's there's big bull elephants out there that have tusks that weigh over a hundred pounds um, each one. So those alone add a huge amount of weight. And then you can you can imagine when you add all the the, the muscle structure over the, the, the skeletal structure. Um, that starts to add a huge amount of weight. Muscle is quite dense. The uh, trunk itself is 300 pounds. Um, so, yeah, the skull is not actually as heavy as you would think it is. I mean, I'm able to lift it um, quite easily. It's not that, that sort of heavy. Um, I would say probably the weight of this would be maybe like 40 pounds, 50 pounds, um, this particular skull. Interesting enough, though, the lower jaw is much, 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 much heavier than the, the skull, funny enough. Uh, just the lower jaw itself, is, it almost feels like a heavy weight, and that's because the lower jaw is a lot more solid, and that's a big grinding plate that comes up. So as they lift that lower jaw, that's what's compressing the vegetation that they eat. Very, very cool. Now, I can actually hear some Ellie's behind us, so i will try to see if we can go and catch up with those and see if they're going to go and have a little drink at the pan nearby. Corky's bundle of joy is non-stop, cannot control herself. I got a really nice photo with the pseudopenis extended and really think we can see that Corky's had a little girl, the future of the Juma clan. <laughs> now, I, I know we all know that has, hyenas have bizarre genitalia, and they do. And it's a very unique specialization through natural selection and it gives the females the power. So because it's such a matriarchal system and it really is all about the females and hyenas, that's why they have sort of adapted this unique genitalia. And it's essentially an elongated clitoris. And although that sounds bizarre, believe it or not, female spider monkeys and squirrel monkeys also have an enlarged clitoris, but they also do have a normal vagina and no scrotum features like hyenas do. So hyenas are the most bizarre of them all, but they're not the only ones to have an enlarged clitoris, if you like. Spider monkeys and squirrel monkeys also have the same. And it just gives an advantage to the females. There's a striking resemblance between the genitalia, and that's why it's so difficult for us to sex the cubs. I remember on Theo's first drive at the den, I was talking about trying to sex hearts cups and after we went off air, he said, but Lauren, you can see it's a male. Why, why are you confused? I said, oh, Theo, sadly, it's not that simple when it comes to hyenas and it's really not. They were thought to be hermaphrodites for such a long time. But they're not, they're not at all. I was completely wrong. They have their separate sexes. It was just very confusing for a time when people didn't understand hyenas. They were just very confused as to what was going on. Why are they all male? Well, they're not. And sometimes I feel a little bit sad for male hyenas because they really don't have it easy. And mating in itself is not easy somehow they've got to get round the challenge of the genitalia. Riley, hyena cubs are born completely with that silver spoon in their mouth, just like the royal families. Oh. I don't know what's happening. I think there could be another hyena coming in. Yep. A 
Is that ribbon? It's ribbon, isn't it? Look at that. Teal up dominance. Well, if we were ever in doubt who the matriarch was, there you have it. Ribbon! I wonder if Ribbon's boys will come out now. That'd be lovely to see all five cubs. I want them all to line up really nicely along the edge of the termite man. Sit still, face me. We'll take a family portrait and then they can go about their day. Ah, I see more heads popping out. So yes, sorry, Riley, it's a nepotistic society. You are who your mother is. So normally hyena cubs are born of the rank of their mother or a little bit lower. So if you come from a low-ranking mother, you yourself will be low-ranked. Now, it's slightly different between males and females, but it's your mother's rank. The sort of interesting situation was that in Tima, who's Ribbon's older daughter, three and a half now, always appeared to be slightly higher than... Ribbon. Back in the day when Ribbon was at the bottom and we could never understand that. It was rather bizarre. But of course, Ribbon is now very much at the top. And Heart's cub is feeding with her. That's brave. Ribbon has a remarkable tolerance for the cubs. I know many of us found it hard when Corky got overthrown, but Corky was injured and I do believe it was possibly the best thing for the clan. And Ribbon's proven to be a remarkable matriarch, really remarkable. She's blown me away with her ability with ease to be an incredible leader of this clan. Oh, the dynamics are changing. I'm hoping very soon Ribbon's boys make an appearance. A warm welcome to all our viewers. We are currently here at Ambion Ningala, and after such an exciting morning tracking these lions, we tracked them for like two hours before we eventually found them. Um, and right there you can see the mother with the two young cubs. So this is part of that pride where we have those two white lions. Well, look at how that young um, cub has just turned onto its back, lying down right next to mum. Looks like it might be the young male. There's the young female getting up. So... I'm Nikki. I'm going to be a ranger uh, for this morning, and uh, with me is Ger. And just to give you an idea, so this morning we decided let's go and look for these lions. And because it's overcast weather, we found some tracks, but it was really hard to see where they were going. And the lions were hunting during the whole night. Um, and then early on this morning, as we were following the tracks, um, we had to go do a little walk, and uh, luckily, uh, we're able to find these lions. So. Incredible. And I wonder, maybe because they have been moving quite a bit during the evening, they just decided to find a nice open space, probably been hunting wildebeest and zebra, um, and eventually settle down for the day. That young cub is so relaxed. Have a look at that left paw there, how he's resting it on his belly. I'm having a look and just if you look around that little cub, you'll notice there's quite a bit of dung um, that's been scattered probably by the Franklin. So he's using that as a, as a mattress. Um, just so that he's nice and comfy. So, okay, guys, just a bit of an update on these cheetahs. The cubs have now visibly relaxed. We don't see them Currently, we just had a visual of one coming into that little gap that we're looking at right now. But then he had a look at us and came a little closer and then moved off into the thickets just on, a, on the left-hand side of the screen again. You can still see there's the little shepherd's tree, that one with the green leaves, where mom is lying. 
and it's a very good spot for her to be lying at the moment, nice and shady, um, with a shepherd's tree, quite thick coverage of leaves, small leaflets, but very, very thick coverage. So typically the shade that it creates is quite nice and dense. But I can see movement of the one cub coming into that little gap here. There you can see the little head. So quite quickly relaxing again. Very, very cute. So we just had a question from Nectar. At what, at what age do cheetahs reach adulthood? Typically, you'll find that the mom will raise them up until about 18 months to sometimes two years before she pushes them out. You know, if she is a successful mother and she raises her cubs or cub successfully, that's a, a more or less the amount of time that they'll spend with the mom before, she, before they get pushed out. And then it will be another maybe two years before they reach full maturity. Um, some of them a little sooner, some of them a little later, depending on the individual, you know, just like we do. Um, but normally you'll find that they get pushed out by their mom to have a new litter of cubs. There you can see another cub now in the background, guys. Um, to have a new litter of cubs at around two, well, 18 months to two years. Um, so then they can go off and fend for themselves. Um, sexual maturity, however, is a little later than that. Uh, for the females, it's normally a bit sooner. So they typically can fall pregnant here from three years, maybe three and a half. And then with the males a bit later, because just the reason for that is not necessarily because they're not mature yet, but you'll find them only getting strong enough to compete for the females a little later in their life because you know the the ladies are all about who's the strongest boy in the in the area at that time so um, I'd say typ typically adulthood is reached around three and a half well three three and a half to four years but they'll lose or move away from their mom at around two years of age to slowly kind of get ourselves into a position where we've got a most beautiful view of two young bulls drinking. The rest of the herd sounds like they're still coming down, but these two guys have made their way first, and it's so cool to be with them. It's so special to watch them drink without them really knowing that we're here. The one on the left is a little bit aware that there's something going on. There's a bit of a breeze blowing, and every now and then he puts up his trunk to smell us and um, we're right near the camp and so you might hear a bit of a noise in the background and that's the guys working at the camps themselves um, and so I think they're just aware that there is a little bit of a disturbance in this area but for us at the moment we've gotten ourselves into a position where we don't have the best cover you can see it's quite a clean sort of path towards them but we've approached with the wind in the right direction and we were very quiet and we have an escape route to our right so even though it looks really open and kind of clear from us to the elephants there's a nice little route that we can take just to the right hand side here that drops us into a drainage line and then onto a big bank straight away so it's an okay place for us to be um it's perfectly fine for us to watch them and particularly because they don't know that we're here at the moment so they're in a situation now where they're just drinking they're doing what they would naturally do which is exactly the aim of when we do these walks their idea to do walks is to try and get in and view the animal and remove yourself without the animal knowing that you're there so cool now we're talking just now with the skull about how the trunk sits and how they drink water so you can see roughly how they're doing it at the moment they basically suck up this water and then they curl their trunk back towards their mouth now it's an important part of the curling is the fact that the sediment that they pick up actually settles in that bend of the trunk and so what you'll often find with elephants if you watch the ones that is drinking on the right hand side it'll probably be easier is that they'll squirt water in and then there's a small amount that they drop out of their trunk now that amount of water that they're dropping out is the water that's filled with all the heavy particles that they've sucked up so bits of sand and um, particularly but any like little twigs or anything like that that maybe was on the surface of the water they're able to pull that up and then just drop it back down again without having to drink it so if you watch there we go let's put it in now watch when it comes back out 
they see there's a dribble that takes place, and that's basically the dribble that we're talking about. But these two, it's interesting, I'm surprised that the two of them are so far from the herd because they're both quite young bulls. Um, they're probably around sort of 10 to 12 years old, somewhere there. Um, so their time with the herd is slowly starting to come to an end, but... Um, I'm surprised that they're so far from the rest of them. The rest of the herd seems like they're quite a long way away. And it seems like they're going to start departing now. So we'll probably try and just give them a bit of room to leave and try and get ourselves into a safer spot. So, viewers, welcome to the Mara. We have some very a good surprise for you we have we're back to the Savo den and we have the kittens and the mom around but they're playing hide and seek at the moment we're trying to habituate them so that we are able to see them now this den has been here for a little while this den has been here for a little while, so the mama, Savo, is doing a good job keeping this kitten. So my name is Tim, and behind camera we have Big James. This Savo den has been here for quite a little while. We have the mom around at this time. So we think that she's ready to move the den, because often in time you find that if a den is discovered by either predators or something else they keep changing the den but it seems like this is a very good den so they're going to be here for a little while often at times you find that if a den is discovered they will change it as soon as possible so we're going to stay here and habituate them a little while because the mom is around so she takes the kittens to safety. So as we wait for, for them to come out and play, because the sun is still not as hot, we'll keep you posted. So have a look at where this youngster has now maneuvered himself. So remember we're talking about that dung midden right next to the mom? Now, the only thing you can see is you can see the head and a bit of the shoulders. But he looks so comfortable. I can see the young sister is now coming to join up. So she's just behind her. It might even be that the young sister is more concerned of probably trying to see if she can get a drink from mom. I'll see her moving closer. There she goes. Yeah, she's more concerned on having a drink. Of course, the young male feels like he's being left out. Now, what happens is because they know they get to this age where their teeth are starting to become really sharp, um, and also the, <laughs> they themselves um, are getting to a stage where they all eat more meat and drink less of mom's milk. And sometimes, if they do get over ego, if they're hungry, they'll suckle mom. But sometimes it's so hot or so. It hurts her so much that she'll eventually like get up and start moving away. And uh, that's probably what happened right now. So what I'm going to do is, uh, I can't really see her from this angle that we are now. We can see some of the other lines, but just to show you where they are, and then hopefully we can try and reposition from here. Um, we might just loop around to that side, and then we'll be able to show you the other lines as well. But uh, Wilton Bechert and I are going to try and see if we can get another glimpse um, or another uh, possible view of these lines. Very good, Nikki. To see Simba. Simba is our local uh, name for lions in Swahili. But now here, I got some small little predators running in the grass there crossing the road maybe 
Not sure for what reason, because where they were, I think they had enough. Ground cranes in the background there. And two of them beautiful birds sunning themselves. Bungay, do you want to chase your friends? Because Bungay loves mungus. But he thinks, let's first show you this beautiful sound, these beautiful birds that are enjoying with the last one they are left behind. And every time I ask Bungay why he loves the banded mungus, he always tells me, keep quiet, I love them. And then I'll tell you the reason why. Sometimes we call them the striped mungus. Now going through a lot of buffaloes. It's very difficult to see the mungus or the mungis slow down. They're always on the move. They're always doing something. They feed very quickly. They drink very quickly. And they just move, move. It's very typical. And more so of the striped mungus. Let's see the behavior of the buffaloes. I'm sure they're looking at them like ants. And definitely no standoff between these two species here. <laughs> they're wondering what they're up to. If there were jackals or other bigger predators, you'd see the body language of these cave buffaloes will definitely change. Haran, that's a very good question, and you're asking whether the banded mungus are bigger than meerkats. Yes, by far, they're bigger. And apparently, they're related. Background, same lineage in the family. But these ones do not behave, or they do not have dents, or dents rather, the, like the meerkats. But you also see them behaving like the meerkats, standing up once in a while, watching out for their safety going in groups and to me they go in bigger colonies than the meerkats and every time i see the banded mungus here in, in east africa they remind me of the meerkats in the kalahari the main food will be beetles they look for worms in the ground like millipedes they have also been known to eat spiders and scorpions. But also, they do eat fruit at the same time. That one must have got something she's digging from the ground. Got very sharp claws, small ones though. And very quickly, they dig, get what they are getting. They may forage it together as a group. But when it comes to it, what you catch, it is yours. Yeah, these buffaloes are not interested or concerned, rather. Beautiful scenery there. Well done, Bungay. I love seeing the Olololo in the backdrop there. Our great crown cranes still sunning themselves. It was rather cold when we started the drive here in the Maasai Mara of Kenya. Putting the feathers where they should be. Printing. Sometimes getting a little itchy. I love how the wind is blowing the feathers of this grey crown cranes. Well, you've been following me with the story of Jasiri, the baby elephant that had a bad foot that I haven't seen now for going about a week. That is what I want to concentrate in for the next uh, one hour or so. So back to our servo kittens again. Now we've turned, we've gone behind the bush where they've been playing hide and seek. Now these two little kittens have been jumping up around trying to dodge and hide away from us but we are far quite in a, in a good distance where we are trying to habituate. Now the mom is inside that thicket where I think the mom wants to, to live but I think the 
the kittens still want to follow mom. So mom is keep, keeps on walking out and in the den because at this time, mom wants to go and find something for them to eat. Now, that is a very good den where at least Lana, thank you for your question. Now, sometimes it's very difficult to tell the population because savos are savanna dwellers. They live in the grass. Now, we don't often see them, so I'll be, I'll not be able to answer well, but I'm sure the population is, is big. Only that we don't often see them here in the wild. The on, we're only lucky here because this den was discovered by my colleague and because of that we pinned and marked this point where we'll be able to come and see them often. So I would say it's, uh, it's not very much big of a population. Now that kitten is jumping out around. I'm sure mom, mom will wait for them to go in and then she will walk out and go find something for them to eat later. Welcome back everybody to Anbion Pinda where things have just started getting interesting again. There are a couple of water girl just out of picture on your left hand side who Craig is kindly showing us now. And don't the wind is in the lion's favour. It's blowing from the water to us, but that one here you see now with its head up is very alert as it makes its way down here. Let's see if anything happens. Maybe they come down to this watering hole closest to us. But, oh, oh, oh. Even further left of this warthog is another one that's trotting very quickly towards us and they're actually now lying in spots where there's a little bit of cover even the mom of the, the two really small youngsters is, is in hunt mode. She's got her ears pricked down, body language, all very much showing interest in these warthog. But again, I think an experience here from the, the youngsters, you see how this one's now sat up a bit. I think has maybe slimmed their chances. Unless they go into that little drinking trough those warthog if they go down in there they obviously won't be able to see out and that might be their best opportunity of closing the gap between them and the warthog and, and actually trying to catch one it is quite hot it takes a lot of energy for them to to hunt so it really has to be perfect for them to to set off you can see that warthog is now Maybe just because of the angle of the slope, there's a little bit of water that's collected there for, for it to be able to drink there. But the other one up at the top is pacing up and down quite frantically. And I don't know, maybe it's seen those ones that are lying a little bit more exposed. at the top of your picture is up and down looking left and right for that very reason that things like these lions could be lurking around the watering hole it hasn't come down to drink just yet and rightly so because there are a couple of lions dotted around this watering hole the mother of the three youngsters could be anywhere as well so perhaps if she's now Returning to where she left them here this morning, comes back and they the auto go off. Lucky, lucky morning for those auto as they run away into the distance. Coming back to the lines, you see their body language has changed. They've sat back up. They are lying out really exposed. And one of the youngsters they lying just off to the right of the, of the mom has tucked itself right into that little bush behind its sibling. 
I might have been in search of a few other things today or well, this morning. I'm not sure the slot will get up to anything for the foreseeable future. Let's see if we can't find some rhino or the likes out in the open areas. You can see the young female has now decided to go and lie down just right next to mom. Now she's constantly trying to go for a drink, but every time she approaches mom too quickly, mom gets a bit irritated and snarls at her. So she's still trying her luck. Yep, she feels maybe let me go back to my brother. So she did that early on and went back um, to where her brother's lying down and then came back and tried again to suckle. But it's also getting to that stage now where it's going to be um, mom is going to tolerate it less and less until eventually they, they are weaned and they don't um, rely on her milk anymore. Only water um, and then of course anything that they catch and eat. You can see she's now going to play with that young white female. It's incredible to, incredible to watch the interaction with the cubs around, especially the older lions within the pride. Um, and you find that especially the females are very, very curious. The males as well. Um, but uh, within this particular pride, we've noticed that the younger male uh, females are the ones that often get up and um, are very curious whenever the cubs move anywhere. But these two are sitting under a guari bush. Um, and that young white female, there was a lot of flies around her, so she actually moved into that bush to try and get her like away from some of the flies. But uh, looks like she's just grabbed onto one of the branches. Stuck in bed with this particular pride that we are looking at, there's two white lines. So that one there, which is the young female, and then what I want to do is just move off to the left. So the rest of the pride is basically the direction that she was staring in now, um, and that's the young male. Now, just want to quickly show you. So those are the, two, the only two white lines within this particular pride. There you'll see the majority of the pride also lying down. You can just see the white bellies, but look off to the right. You'll notice there's a, or in between, right above this bush, there's the young white male. But uh, such an incredible sighting. I mean, we're sitting here and there's 16 lions around us in this area. It's quite a scene. It's always incredible when you have that many lions milling about around you. We, on the other hand, are about to get a whole bunch more illies to mill around about around us because as we're trying to kind of start to leave, we started to see some of the big cars coming down the hill towards this dam. So we've gotten ourselves onto um, a mound, which basically means we've kind of done a, a swap over with the, the little two young bull ellies. They've gone into the bush and we've come out the bush and onto the mound where they were drinking. And the hope that the rest of the herd's going to come out and we'll get a really nice view of all the little ones. There's a small baby in the group that we saw earlier. Um, so I'm hoping that that little baby will come down. And it's been just such a magic morning to spend... You know, almost, what is it now, two and a half hours, three hours, um, following a herd of elephants around on foot without them once knowing that we're here. 
has been special there. You can see them coming down the hill. They've got this swagger to them as they come down the hill. Um, it's quite funny when elephants start to smell water. They start to get this walk where they kind of bounce um, and they start to make their way kind of down to where they, they can smell it. It's not now obviously found something to eat, but um, there's a few of them coming. We can hear a lot more coming down as well so i'm hoping that they'll all start to emerge eventually and, and the little ones too and because we kind of up and, and raised and sort of a radiant place we're not going to be moving much at all or making any noise they should kind of walk right by us without really realizing that we're here which will be really cool this is one of my favorite little pans to watch ellie's at because you can get fairly close to them but very safely um and so for a walk situation uh, it works really well. This mound that's just off of where the water is uh, makes for the ideal location to to view Ellie's from. So cool. It's, like I said, not every day that you'll be able to spend this amount of time with the elephants. So they, they're very aware creatures, so they pick up, you know, smell and, and they hear things really well. So to to stick around them for long periods is not easy on a walk. Generally, what you find is that you'll view them and then you'll let them go because they're kind of moving. But this morning, it just seems like they keep moving where we're heading and we keep kind of bumping into each other with these beautiful kind of views of them. So it's been an absolute treat. And one of my favorite ways to spend time, that's for sure. Right, well, we're going to be patient. They're slowly, slowly heading this way. They're obviously just stopping and eating, and I'm sure they eventually will emerge and come and have a little drink. I'm not quite sure if the elephants Tristan have in Juma are as wet like this one here in the Masai Mara of Kenya. Now, it rained yesterday, and it seems like these earlies have been enjoying water all over. So they're slowly feeding while heading to fresher grounds where they've, there's a little bit of fresh leaves that have popped out on the, on the twigs and leaves. Well, now, at this time, freak, uh, trips to the water are less frequent because we have lots of water puddles, or water holes around this place. So the elephants stick around grazing at these places. Now, we have a mixed herd here. We have uh, some that have younger calves and some that have older calves. Now, when they, are, they congregate at a place like this, elephants will mix up from different families. And sometimes they split and head to, to their respective families. Now all over, all the way down into the savannah, you can see it's, there's loads and loads of elephants. It's st still cool and quiet, so they're still enjoying the lush green and the water that is in the grass. See the young one there? trying to get some grass and still watching. How often do elephants sleep? Now, elephants don't regularly sleep, but they take time to sleep during the day. So the young ones are the ones that sleep mostly, but sometimes during the day, you find that elephants will stand and sleep for a little while. So I'll say they take time during the day to sleep, which which is uncountable times, especially during the hot, hot, hot day, and sometimes during the night, especially when they have the young ones like this. They don't walk a long distance since the young ones are still not very strong to keep up with the pace. So they take time stop and sleep so i can say it uh, on a regular basis they'll definitely sleep especially when they have small babies like this now you can see that we have older calves and smaller calves but then on the edges here we have some bulls that were trying to follow this 
So these two here had tried to follow the herd, but then some of the mothers chased them away. So they don't want to keep a close association with these guys. That's why they've moved to a higher ground while the mom and the calves head down, maybe to a good grazing area. This is simply because teenage elephants tend to bully the young ones. And so the moms will always do a good job keeping these teenage elephants away from the herd. See some doves enjoying there and the little cattle eat egret following this elephant. It's not as hot, so they're still flapping not as much, which is a good indicator that they're still enjoying the breeze. See, the elephants are facing away from the wind. So when the wind blows between, in between their ears, it's cooling the blood in their system where they have loads of veins behind the ears, which is a good sign of also cooling themselves down. Other than that, elephants will use mud or sometimes they throw soil onto their back to cool down. So I think for the day they'll still be here around because we have lots of water and enjoy their grazing while strolling up and about. Well done, team. But now we got interesting uh, behavior here of what you'd guess are two bulls. This is one of the most interesting fights, I would say. We've always seen lots of play fights, but I do not think this is a play fight here. Having the trunk up and ears open makes him look big. And this young bull here have chickened out. They've been going on for like the last 10 minutes and hmm. Stop. Face the other way. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> uh, they've got a bush there. Maybe they may come back or they may come out on the other side. But from where I am, I could hear the tats locking each other. Susan, you are asking an update on Jasiri. And the last time you were with me, Susan, I spoke of like spending the next one hour, one, one and a half hours or so trying to trace her. But this is, I've gone to about one full week without having seen her. But yesterday, the game warden spotted her actually with two different elephant families and quite distant from where I saw her last. So Susan, the good news are, she's now more mobile than before, which is pretty good news. The only thing is I haven't seen her personally, but Susan can tell you the Siri is doing very well. And the reason I came here is to chance and see if I could see, get her, but I have to be very patient. You know, elephants like now, if you look at them carefully, they feed while moving very, very slowly. But for me to be able to identify the Siri, I have to wait until she moves and I pick up that small little limp on her front uh, right foot, which I'll continue patiently looking at this herd of elephants. Well, patience is the best way when it comes to elephants and our patience is certainly being rewarded. Look at this. I'm actually going to keep quiet so you can hear the splashing of the water. I don't know if you can hear it, but... special we are seriously fortunate the wind is blowing perfectly from us to them 
I'm sorry, from them to us, um, which means that we don't have to worry too much about the wind problem. But it's so cool to be sitting this close to Ellie's on foot with the sound of them drinking. The rest of the herd is slowly coming out of the cow and a couple calves are, are going to appear shortly. Um, they're still just feeding on a bush just on the edge of the clearing. Um, so they'll join this one um, in a little bit. So it's probably in the next sort of two, three minutes they'll start to arrive. But our plan worked absolutely perfectly. This is what I was hoping for from the moment we found them this morning. Lauren, so yes, this is a man-made waterhole. This is a waterhole that's just in front of um, one of the camps here at Juma. Um, and so if you look at it, you can see there's a concrete edging to it. Um, so generally what you'll find is waterholes that are this size at this time of the year are normally dried up. Um, if it's a natural one, this particular pan is pumped, and it's why the Ailies like to come to it, because the pumping of the water means that they caught guaranteed fresh water almost daily. Look, here comes the calf and the calf. There's a cow that's going to come right towards where we are. Isn't this amazing? We have elephants all around us at this stage. Now, I'm going to just keep my voice down because they are very sensitive to hearing. Luckily, where we are at the moment, this mound is very steep. So the Ellie's don't like coming up on top of this mound at all. But you see, look how she's smelling. Earlier I was telling you how delicate they can be with their trunk. Watch how she's feeding. So it's more about understanding what your role is and how you're going to position yourself. With any sort of animal, size is a big thing. And so positioning yourself on top of a very big termite mount like we have at the moment means that we already appear much larger to these elephants than we actually are. Um, and that means that they inherently would be quite nervous. If I stood up now, you'd find these ele elephants would all rear back and move away from us. The other thing is understanding the the conditions um, and so as long as you you know what you're doing and you know where you're positioning yourself you can have a very safe walk um, now ultimately with guests i would probably never take guests this close um the, the lucky part we have here is that it's myself and the Kimmon and, and we have our game scout solly that's with us so it's a very small group it means that we can get up and we can be very quiet and we all understand exactly how things work out and that allows us to be able to position ourselves like this but i must be honest you know a friend of ours was was recently unfortunately tragically killed by an elephant and it, it brings that into perspective it always means that when you with them on foot especially now I was acutely aware of how dangerous they can be but look at this I mean it's a wild elephant and it's maybe three four meters in front of us We have 
this baby that he's feeding. Right, well, we're gonna sit you. We're gonna quickly send you over. Wow, ladies and gentlemen, I think I'm seeing a huge rupture on these a shepherd tree here and I want to get you close there and I got a feeling this is a Tony eagle and she caught herself something that to me is a snake I didn't see her catch it but I saw her fighting with a snake on top of that tree she must have killed it elsewhere and then she came flying on top of this balanite tree I guess it's a Tony Eagle, can't see very well, but if you look carefully, that to me looks like a snake she's feeding on. You can see the tail, and by the time she got here, it was not dead as yet. I saw her trying to kill it with her feet and beak, and peeling it down against the branch with her clothes. Mini raptor has got very strong talons. And if you look carefully, that's the tail part of the snake. And most raptors we all know are carnivores. Look, you can tell she's not dead as yet, the snake. Uh, still trying to survive, but I think the head is what she dealt with first. But still, some life in this snake. Not sure what type of a snake this could be. You can see the whole body from the branch, and she's stepping on the bigger part. And I think Beverly, I agree with you 100%. You're saying so cool, and even for me, the last. Rob tries to eating a snake was a black chested snake eagle. I've always known all eagles will eat snakes. But this is my first Tony eagle to see feeding on a snake. I say she must have done very well. First to kill it, to fly with it on that tree. And you can see how clever she is stepping on the body, part of the snake near the head, where the fight of, would have gotten bigger. Not much movement on the snake now. Most likely the coordination between the brain from the head to the other body parts could be cut by now. And that's why we're not seeing her wriggling like before. But the first few minutes, I saw the fight still going on on top of his branch, indicating that she was not dead as yet. We've got all types of snakes in the Mara. Could be a black mamba. Could be some sort of cobra. But I'm thinking of it in those lines because if you look carefully, she looks quite long. You can see that. That to me is an average of three feet, not knowing the length on the branch now and how much this Tony Eagle has already eaten. Remember, this is live, and you're more than welcome to ask us questions or send comments to hashtag World Earth on Twitter or at LC, the comments question of the YouTube chat channels. Be careful you don't lose your prey. If you're not very careful, after all your hard work, you'll drop your snake. Flat cut, good question. And you're asking if this could be the African rock python. Possibly, and if it is, it's definitely a young one. 
flat cut, I'm sure you know, our African rock pythons are huge snakes by any standard, and I would highly, highly doubt that any bird of prey, any raptor, would bring down one, unless, of course, the martial eagles, the females. But I think if you're right, looking at the tail, it could lead me to that direction, but it should be a baby African rock python, possibly flat cut. Because that's the end tail of many African rock pythons. They look like that, unlike the cobras and the mambas. We know how the rock pythons will always get the prey by constricting their bodies. And I think flat cuts uh, could be very could be very convinced this could be an African uh, rock python. And I'm sure the reason why I would also say that, because most of them, if not all of them, they are not venomous. And these eagles know what snakes to deal with, because if they go for black mamba or any venomous snake, they know the bite of either of them would be uh, fatal. You can hear her break the bones if you listen carefully. She's using its hooked, sharp, strong beak to shear and cut the flesh of this that was African rock python. Flat cut, I think we may agree that this is the African rock python, unless something else changes. And maybe if she does not devour everything, including the skin, and like they have like a claw at the very end of the tail, I'd be happy to swing by here, maybe this afternoon or tomorrow, and investigate any pieces that have fallen on the ground. And I'd say this has made my day. Welcome everybody to Anbion Panda where we have found a white rhino and just behind her quite a young calf you can see just sticking out above the grass. You see the winds picked up quite a bit since you last left us with those lions. So we left in search of something else and we found these two. These two now walking into the wind in this little bit of a drainage line here off to just behind them that you can see. That's obviously a little bit more sheltered from the wind as they make their way. They're heading in the direction of a watering hole. You can see mom's a little bit darker than the, the youngster behind it. You, I'd say just judging by the growth of its horn so far is maybe around a year, year and a half and its size. But those big ears Again, working overtime as they walk out into these open areas. And I might just stick with it. You can see that young yeah, is yeah, quite a bit lighter than mom in colour. Maybe if they were at the same watering hole that they're walking towards now, maybe mom had a bit of a wallow and the youngster didn't or just lay flat on its the under, underside of it got a, a little bit of mud. But they haven't really stopped to, to feed it all. They both got their heads down and walking at quite a pace. And for every two or three steps that mom takes, that youngest has got to take at least double double that. And it sometimes gets caught behind it or lags behind. And then it sort of trots to catch up to mom. It's actually quite sweet to watch. Mom, just let me creep slightly further forward to see now if we can't get a view of them as they come up and over this mound in front of us and hopefully cross the road. Eden, you're asking how tough a rhino skin is. Or have, have a look at these two now. I'll stop here just to give them a little bit of space if they do want to cross. But, and you might, I don't think you'll be able to hear Eden, but it's incredibly tough. It's a good maybe two, three inches thick. But as it walks past these 
dead thorn trees, the sickle bush and the likes, and even in other areas, it walks through incredibly dense and and thorny trees sometimes. And you can just see, in fact, if you ever look at that moth, you'll see it's got a couple of scrapes along it from where she's walked past thorn trees and, and sickle bush and the likes earlier. Incredibly tough skin. I mean, that those scratches probably would get rid of an itch for her, if anything. But it is incredibly tough. It's, it's kind of, there's the amazing to now see a little bit closer that youngster also just as I talk, that right ear of it has remained tuned in on us the entire time. The other ear is doing a little bit of work to see if it can't hear anything on the other side. But coming right out into the open this morning. Now hiding behind that bush and they're going to eventually cross the road. But how special is that? Just look at the sheer size. It takes up both lanes of this road that we're on. Here's Curious George coming to have a, a look at us but hot on mom's heels as they, they venture further away. emerge now and I'm going to keep quiet because I just want you to listen to how amazing this is. following the chronicles of Miss Clalamba. We left today and we had a fantastic 40, well, two hours there, two hours plus. But eventually the adults did leave, which meant we have to leave. But we held on to the very end to see if Shimbulu and Ngwazi popped out and unfortunately they didn't. So now we are back at the kill site that we were with Clalamba yesterday. So this is in the Mowati. 
with the Inyala carcass. She has another carcass, which is the one we were trying to show you this morning, in the Hosanna jackalberry. She has two hoisted carcasses. Now there's, I see a pair of hyena ears at the bottom here. I'm going to guess it's in the belly again, but I don't know. I can only see the very tips of the ears and I'm not sure that Neos can probably get it from this angle. So our princess here just needs to walk maybe a hundred meters and she has a different meal waiting for her. <laughs> a moment on the lips, an inch on the hips, Miss Clalamba. Oh, she's some girl, she really is. And of course, it wasn't her kill last night, it was Falco's, she stole it. A defiant act of revenge, I would guess. And she hoisted it because she knows immediately. No, the hyenas are not going to get it if it's hoisted. And for some reason, she's came back to this carcass, the Anyala. I think she's going to keep bouncing between the two, which is just wonderful. I think she wants to come down, but there's a hyena at the bottom. So what does one do? One will groom, I think. <laughs> Tracy, you're saying what a magnificent girl. Oh, I know Tracy, isn't she? And you can leave your carcass on lose it. Get your carcass up that tree and it's all yours. As you can see, we're still sitting with the Elise at the moment. It's so special and there's just more and more coming. There's one coming to say hello on our left here. It's ridiculous. And it's just everything has aligned perfectly now. Of course, it doesn't always work out as well. Sometimes we get situations where the wind changes slightly or, you know, an elephant spots us and it changes the way things are. But today, everything has just aligned perfectly. Look here, this elephant's coming right up towards us. we kind of moving a little bit with the camera but not stressed enough to worry about us it's gone back to feeding which is always a good sign so if you're ever viewing elephants as soon as they start feeding again that always tells you that they are in a relaxed state um, when they stop feeding is when you need to worry it's like another big cow on her way this is just a ridiculous sighting of the sheer number of elephants that we have in the Kruger system. Uh, 
Um, it's tricky to know each individual. I mean, we're looking at probably close to 18,000 different elephants. So to know them all would be would be near impossible. Um, and then you'd have to follow them for their lifespans. But just judging by the behavior that we witnessed earlier, I think the matriarch is one of these two females on the right hand. So the one that's kind of arrived and then the one to the right of her, those are the two that everybody seems to scatter for when they arrive. Um, and just judging by their general body condition, um, size of the tusks, the, the, the temple area that sinks in, I would say the female on the right hand side, she's probably maybe in her 40s, um, and the female on the left also probably in that area, which is quite old for an elephant. Um, most elephants within the Kruger ecosystem are, are, are not living beyond 50 to 55 years of life, um, and that's partly due to the fact that the environment that they live in is quite woody, which means that there is a, a deterioration of their teeth um, pretty quickly, um, which is what, you know, stops them from... Isn't this just ridiculous, though? Wow, we have been spoiled. Well, we're just going to sit here and continue to marvel at what is one of the most incredible experiences anyone can have on a bushwalk. You can see some of the members of the Pride have just picked up their head. Now the wind is blowing from, just to give an idea, so they see the direction that lion is looking into, so the wind's coming from that direction straight towards it. Now I wonder if there's maybe something that has moved across and the scent has blown onto these lines, and that's why the one just picked up his head. And I'm very curiously trying to figure out exactly what it is. Now, if we give it some time, if we don't know, maybe these lines could eventually start getting up. Or, and let's say if there might be nothing there, they will eventually get up and start moving uh, maybe closer to some cover. There's some that have already started moving in under the trees. Um, it is slowly starting to warm up, so there's a good chance that these ones will eventually will go and join um, the rest of the pride. Oh, this one that just gone up on the right. Now let's have a look. It might be that she'll go all the way. Remember where we saw the cubs and the other female lying down? It might be that she can go all the way there and join up with them. seen sometimes with um, especially the youngsters when they do meet up like the one will just flop on top of the other one now let's have a look and see what happens here I didn't even see there was another lion in that bush you do get white lions um, within the greater Kruger area um, as well as some of the uh, neighboring reserves like in the Timbavati so there's there's a few areas and it doesn't necessarily mean like even if the white lions um, if you find some of them at Angola tomorrow they could have moved off the reserve into different areas so they're not necessarily just only at Angola you can find them um, in other areas as well but seeing a white lion though is something that is quite rare um, within the wild and you have to go to specific places in order to do it now we've been very lucky that this pride which we refer to as the birmingham pride because they do come from the birmingham concessions is that they um, are mainly seen on Angola. So this pride, um, the majority of the time spent is here on Angola. But as I mentioned, they do cross off um, into other areas and there are other white lions around as well. Um, but from, from our side here is that we're very lucky in the fact that there's two white lions um, within this pride.
Welcome back to NBN Pinder, everybody, where we've managed to find two more white rhino who are absolutely caked in mud. They're actually still wet from from a little bit of a mud bath that they had earlier. And now they've found a, a tree that's been pushed over, perhaps, by elephants. Got a perfect to to scratch. You can see the ones getting rid of a bit of an itch at the back there on the top side of a horn and also just providing them with a little bit of shade it's almost like an umbrella you can see that thorn tree that's been pushed over and i wonder if it's not the same video that damon filmed that rhino getting rid of an itch on the underneath side of its leg or belly the other day it, it looks exactly like that tree i'm not sure i'll have to ask him but you can see these two are quite content there where they are now. The only little patch where they weren't able to get any mud whatsoever was on their eye, which maybe isn't a good thing because they don't want their eyes to get caked closed as well. But they've got a really, really thick, nice layer of mud on them. And that, you can imagine now, is how they keep themselves quite cool on a hot morning like this morning go cake themselves in mud and with this little bit of a breeze that's blowing bring that, that temperature right down there you can see that tree a little bit better and also they've transferred that mud from themselves onto the tree as they've scratched themselves and shuffled around this one now looking for a bit of a different angle to to scratch it's reversing its backside up <laughs> up onto that tree now it's got a bum in the other one's face And that also, when that mud dries up, when it scratches up against a tree like that, will just help get rid of ticks and parasites and things like that. And I wouldn't be surprised if later on, once these rhinos have moved off, if you had a look at that tree, if you didn't find a couple of ticks and things like that lying below. But that one now, you can see maneuvering its head up and down that branch, it's perfectly positioned to get rid of a, an itch. Sassy Cassie, you're asking how much these rhino weigh. They both look like they are fully grown adults, so I'd say upwards of about two, two and a bit tons of rhino that you're seeing there, which is, I mean, that's huge. And really is a, a large mammal that you are seeing there. And they just chatting about the weight you can actually see that muscle mass behind their neck to support the weight of their head but all of that I mean they don't have they've got quite stocky legs but their, their mass is all their shoulders and then that just the, the their body is is huge Unfortunately for us, even if we wanted to leave, for us, actually fortunately, even if we wanted to leave, there's nowhere that we can go. We have elephants literally all around us on all sides at the moment. And so we're just loving every second of it. But you can see what's happening here is that you've got what I'm sure is the matriarch um, that is hogging the pipe as it's actually pumping water into this pan. So this is on a timer and so the water is just turned on. And so the others are trying to slowly creep in and see if they can get some of that fresh water um, but they're getting pushed away every now and then and so everyone's just patiently lined up um, a lot waiting for their turn and so you can clearly see the sort of hierarchy and structure that takes place within these groups um, you can see how the young elephants are waiting for the big cows to finish drinking once they've had their full then they will be allowed to come in and have a drink and everybody else is kind of just spread out you see so she's pushed them away to allow her calf to drink isn't that cool? Such amazing behavior to witness. It's a clear sign of massive intelligence in these animals that they understand their place um, and that there is this need and desire to 
make sure that their offspring are looked after first before the others. says if you look at the, the big female that's closest to us you can actually see that her ribs are showing and her hips now a lot of people always think elephants are hugely fat and if you see them you would expect her to to be round but you can clearly see that the, the winter period is takes its toll on these guys is that they get a situation where they do start to lose a bit of condition and you can actually make out the ribs and and, and hips bones of ellies when you look closely um, and so they will be eagerly waiting the summer time now to come and the rains to come and, and vegetation to get that much better. But aren't they clever to know that they need to drink out of the pipe where the fresh water is coming out rather than uh, a situation where they must drink the sort of dirty water on the other side of the pan. It's amazing to watch. See, there's a few impalas that are coming down to drink now, which might be funny to watch because the young Ellie's often chase these impalas all over the show, um, particularly when it comes to water. They don't like competition at water at all. And the impala will wait, though. Okay, well, we'll see and wait a little bit to see if the impalas come a little bit closer. Hopefully, we'll get them all drinking at the same time. Yeah. Water is life and no doubt. At one point, everybody will go down the drinking uh, hole to quench their thirst. Now, these are the two elephants we saw earlier that I thought were two bulls going for each other. But I'm changing my mind now because I guess the one on the left is a male and the one to the right is a female. And I've seen the male trying to mount the female but unsuccessfully, and that's why they have tucked way behind the main herd of elephants. So I'll show you the bigger herd of elephants now that have spread out so nicely in this very short grass here and some wonderful light. I mean, I can't believe some of the sightings that we get here in the Mara, including the scenery. Sorry about my head. It makes it very, very colorful. Just look at that. As Bunge is panning, the beautiful Masimara. And I just counted almost a hundred elephants all together. And I'm imagining these are a number of families that have come together. Ron, you ask whether elephants have padding under their feet. And yes, absolutely. Because Ron, if you're so close to elephants when they're moving, you can't hear them. You might just feel the bodies of their feet or legs, you know, rubbing each other as they pass, but they're always very quiet and very soft. So all elephants' feet are padded, and more often than not, they either walk on their toes or their fingers. And they're huge, Ron, very huge circumference. So unless you see their marks in certain areas with very soft ground, you may not even hear them walking. And of course, the white feet gives them the good base to support their big bodies. So I've confirmed the Siri is not in either of these hearts around here. And I want to move on to another herd. And I'm still crossing my fingers. I'll be able to see how myself today.
Well, she's not looking entirely comfortable here. But I think this is the same position that she was positioned yesterday with Tristan. Her belly is full and hanging over the side there. And her and Sutu had a bit of a standoff. It wasn't in the belly, it was Sutu. And they had a bit of a stare down, shall we say, literally. And Sutu just sauntered off, not a care in the world. Talamba, you can't possibly have any more room left in your tummy. Oh, oh, I've got a vulture coming in. She's looking at the vulture. This will be the first time I see a vulture come into a kill in the tree. I don't think Niels can get a view for you. It's a hooded, hooded vulture. Are you able to see it, Niels? No. That's what she's staring at. Wow. And it's probably because this carcass is visible. It's not hidden by the sort of density or the thickness of the tree. This is the first time I've seen a vulture swoop in when there's been a leopard in the tree. Oh, Tlalamba, everyone's after your dinner. She knows it's there. She heard it come in. She's going to move again. She's going to go up and protect it, I would imagine. No, she's not. <laughs> she's just reshuffling her bottom. The vulture's still there. I wonder... I wonder if I can reverse. Can we just go up a little bit and see news? I don't really want to turn the car on. Yeah, there's no view. Trio, they learn to climb trees very early on, really early on. Normally we start to see leopard cubs because they become more mobile at about six weeks. That's when they really sort of start to move a lot and they don't stay hidden in the thicket. They're still in dense sites, but that's normally the age we start to get to spend time with them and they're already trying to climb trees. And it's not very successful at the start. They will fall a lot. They won't get so high. They've got to learn how to sort of use their claws and the bark. They've got to learn how to really pull themselves up using those strong shoulder blades and develop the muscles, of course. But they will start from a really young age. They're very springy. They're so nimble on their feet that I imagine they'll probably start bouncing around a lot earlier than six weeks. Ah, there, the vulture's off. The vulture's left, decided, mm -mm, and off it flies. Probably off to the other carcass of Miss Talamba's. How are you going to protect two, Talamba? That's a lot of work for one leopardess. What an eventful day and an active hyena den. I could not be more happier. Hello, dear. <laughs> Doesn't look comfy to me, but it's clearly comfy for the princess. So from the leopard to elephants here, so like I told you, they don't drink on a regular basis when it rains because there's, I mean, lots of water puddles. But you see these ones here, walking into the forest area where they'll be going to feed. There's more shade there and there's lots of food around that area. But behind the green line, the tree, there's the Mara River. So these elephants will be walking real slowly and cross over the Mara River and go to the other area of the reserve where we call it the Musiara Marsh. So the matriarch is doing a good job leading this entire herd, as you still see the teenage boys there and one of the big mum as they're walking slowly into the bush. Now, they've been spraying themselves with mud, a good sign of cooling themselves down. 
Uh, elephants don't really migrate. I'll say they have a big home range. But then when it dries up, elephants tend to move from one area to, a, to another. They cover a big home range where they'll walk from one area to another. Especially the big meters that are very well experienced. But when they were growing up, these elephants, of course, to passing through generation and generation, they've been walking from one area to another. So these leaders, the matriarchs and the older elephants, will take them from one area to another, but use the same migratory routes which their mothers use. But I'll definitely not say that they simply migrate, but cover a big, wide home range. Elephants gone, we have the sacred ibis slowly picking some arthropods and some vertebrates. Of course, where the elephants step, they've left the ground to be disturbed. So these sacred ibis are enjoying. We've been joined in by a grey heron. Seems like a good area to, to feed. See, the heron has paused a little bit. Maybe there's something or maybe a tadpole into that paddle. There we go, guys. So just in front of us, right over there almost, we just came across a female cheetah with four cubs okay now these cubs are quite a bit larger they're almost the same size as mom already but not as relaxed with the vehicle so we're going slowly closer we're hoping that they might go on top onto the dune over here in front um, there's jackals also harassing them the whole time so I think that might be why they moved away when we approached but they, they should be just here somewhere here in, in front of us. That's, this is the, for those of you who've been following us quite constantly, I don't know if you remember we had a sighting of a mum with four cubs drinking by a waterhole all together. There they go, there they go. So as you can see, quite, quite a distance away. And this is now just the, the value of View, of you know viewing these animals from a small age you can see these ones they actually did not grow up with a vehicle's presence around them you know so with that being the case now that they getting to the point where they are larger individuals they don't know what we are so they are always wary of us so those cubs that we saw earlier you know having the vehicle buzzing around them from an early age and seeing that it's not a not a threat they'll grow up being quite used to the vehicle or to the presence of the vehicle by the time that they get to the stage where these little ones are right now i can see two at the moment there's a third one about to come into the screen there you can see it now and i believe then mom and one more is still to follow from the eye. I see a fourth one now as well. So the nice thing about these cubs already, well, they are at that age where they're almost going to get pushed out by mom. But with that being the case, with them being already so big, they are actually going to help mom when it comes to the hunting. So it's not like it, she's going to be under a tremendous amount of strain um, providing for four hungry or five for that matter hungry stomachs but yeah guys i mean it's just incredible to see the different animals or different individuals reaction to a big buzzing thing coming towards them i mean we are a good i want to say 300 400 meters away from them at the moment and still 
looking to rather move away. And there's many of these cheetahs on Tuolu that that actually operate like, more like this. You know, they've there's some of them that's never seen a vehicle. You know, they might might have been in Tua, on Tuolu now for two, three years, and with it being such a large property, they just don't grow up seeing vehicles around them. But yeah, what a treat to to find these guys as well. Just a, an update on the little little cubs. And the mom that we had earlier, she moved into a spot which was quite difficult, so we left them. And we'll see if they don't move into a better spot a little later on. Well, luckily for us, we don't have to worry too much about not seeing our ears because well, they're still right in front of us at this stage. It's just been so fascinating watching this drinking session take place. It's been quite a lengthy one for elephants. Elephants, a lot of the time, you know, particularly herds, I mean, bulls will often sit for long periods drinking at a water hole, but cows and calves, they generally come in, drink and go. Um, but they've been drinking for quite some time now, and... It's been fascinating to watch how this matriarch is allowing certain elephants to drink and others she pushes away. And you can see she uses her whole body to sometimes just shift everyone along a little bit. And it gets to the point where the young ones get so frustrated that they actually move and start drinking from a different spot. Um, even though they, you know, the fresh water is coming out of the pipe, they'll just drink somewhere else because otherwise they just won't get a chance. And it leads to a few little kind of outbursts of anger every now and then where she kind of chases everybody away and clears a space and then her and her calf drink and then eventually they all start to close back in again. And poor impalas, unfortunately, are just in a situation where they have to just wait. Um, they're not welcome to drink until such time as the ellies are finished. So they're just milling about, waiting, hoping um, for a gap at some point. <laughs> Dr. Rocky Balboa, clearly a movie fan. Um, you're asking, are elephants colorblind? So no, they're not colorblind. Um, most animals that eat vegetation are not colorblind, um, particularly those that feed off fruits um, a lot. Um, so their eyesight is, is a little bit worse than what ours is and not as rich in color, but it is pretty close. So they can see color. Um, they, they're in a situation where their eyesight is pretty good. Funny enough, so with, with a lot of things, they rely more on their, their smell, sense of smell, particularly for fruits, more than vision. So something like a, a, a monkey or us as humans, we look at something and we see it's ripe. They often smell that it's ripe. So if you watch them with marulas, often you'll see the trunk come down and then they smell and then they pick up those that they like. But isn't this just magic? It's so cool. We have so many animals around us and not none of them are phased by our presence. Even these impalas, if we were to generally be walking around and not up on this mound, you'd find that they wouldn't have approached anywhere near where we are. But because we're sitting so sort of quietly on top here, everything is just coming in and is completely oblivious that we're here, which is just the most magic way to be on foot. And to have so many animals, like I said, lots of impalas and, and the elephants, and I'm sure there's a couple of nyala milling about there normally behind us, and there's a drainage line behind us. They normally hang around there, so it's just nice to be in amongst everybody. And I suspect there's the sort of bunching starts to happen again, and trunks start to get pushed towards that pumped water and you're going to start to see tempers flare again. So it keeps happening where they all spread out, then they come together, and then they start to get a bit testy with one another, push each other and grumble, and then everybody resets. So I'm sure it's about to happen again because there's a lot of bodies that have been pushed in there. See how the Majok is using her whole body to push them? Look. See how she just leans on everybody. You're not welcome here. I'm just going to block you off so you can't actually get your trunks to where I am. It's amazing. This has just been incredible. It's probably one of the best early sightings I've had on foot in a long, long time. Um, I typically like to spend a lot of time with Ellie's on foot, but obviously with 
what's been going on. It's been a bit more tricky to be out in the bush as much. And so it's been a while since I've had such a long kind of sighting. And it certainly has been everything I'd hoped it was going to be when we set up this morning, that's for sure. Roger, you're asking if elephants have gums above their teeth. So yes, they do. Um, you know, much like us as humans, the, the tooth has got to sit somehow and there's got to be tissue that binds it um, and, and stops it from wobbling loose and just falling out. When I was showing you the skull earlier, you would have noticed that the teeth were fairly loose. Well, I didn't actually shake them, but the teeth are quite loose because all the tissue and connective tissue that normally holds those teeth in place, i.e. gums, um, has, has decayed away and so the teeth have become far more kind of mobile within the skull. Um, so they need to hold that all together so they'll have what we have. Um, it's quite tricky to get a view of elephants' mouths um, with the teeth and everything and, and it open. It's kind of have to wait for them to lift their heads slightly and then open their mouth and you can see kind of what's going on in there. But they have a very hard palate and then these kind of fleshy structures that hold the, the tooth in place, which is, like I say, is a gum for us, but it's not as soft as what ours are um, and as prone to, to injury. I mean, ours cut quite easily, whereas theirs are pretty um, thickened and hard and, and, and can cope with the, the roughness of the vegetation that they feed on. But they most certainly do have connective tissue that holds them in place. Doesn't get any better than this, that's for sure. So we'll just carry on watching them. There's nowhere to go. I can't really move anyway. Anyway, we've got LEDs all around us. Um, so hopefully at some point they decide to move on. But until then, we're just going to sit and enjoy. You're right, Tristan. It doesn't get any better than this. Or maybe it does for Tlalamba because she's looking rather uncomfortable. <laughs> Panting. Losing heat through evaporative cooling of the mouth, the wet surfaces of the tongue and the inner cheeks. Can you hear the African hoopoo? Oh, she just stopped, I think. Oh. Hoop, hoop, hoop. And that's why she's panting. She's panting, she's hot, she's uncomfortable, she's trying to lose heat, get rid of the heat, and she's digesting clearly quite a lot because she has two meals. I imagine at some point she's going to jump down, Sutu's disappeared, and try and... That looks even less comfortable with Lelamba. Look at that front left paw. Now, for a very petite female, that is one big paw. Lots of power between those bean toes. Look like little beans. But they've got protractile claws inside that use in muscular contractions will allow those claws to push out. So hopefully she finds somewhere a little bit more comfortable soon. So we've come across two families here that are walking towards the river. It seems like this family is walking away, not convinced by the other family. See, sometimes when the two families clash, you find that the youngsters might be disturbed. See that the matriarch here is doing a good job, pausing for a while, and you see, as soon as she stops and starts walking, the rest follows. So we have about two families here, and all these are, it's a breeding herd. They've stopped for a mud puddle, where they've been throwing and washing themselves, spraying with mud while they walk to the forest cover. Now, previously we had another herd that has done the same, walking towards the forest cover and into maybe the Mara River and cross over maybe to the Musiara. We have some young elephants there, teeny tiny ones. Now, how do you tell 
the age of a calf. So before they reach one year old, we call them the underwalkers. So the size of the tiny calves will be the height of the mom's belly. So we call that the underwalkers. So that is easy to recognize when they're below one year. So these teeny tiny ones be following the same herd and sometimes they clash and sometimes wrestle with these other calves from the other families. Now my name is Tim. Behind camera we have Big James. We've been having a good time here with elephants, elephants, elephants. Now this is the second family that is the third family rather going to the river and into the wood line. Now later later on in the evening they'll be walking out again into the savannah. See they've got lots of young ones here. This is a very good breeding herd indeed. Lots of calves, lots of youngsters. Now the slightly older ones will be taking charge in disciplining these young calves. That is a behavior witness in elephants where sometimes cousins, older cousins or older siblings take care of the younger ones, especially when they misbehave. So we can see this family here has a close family unit where we have related females, aunties and cousins. So younger bulls at the age of maybe 16 disperse themselves out of these herds and form what we call bachelor herds. Now, now it's going to take some years before these young ones get to that age. So they're still happy to be with this herd at the moment. See, they're all walking into a different direction. So each matriarch leading the family into a different grazing area. So elephants will only congregate, especially at a waterhole or maybe a grazing area when they're walking towards where they want to go. Now, as you watch closely how these elephants are walking, you can see the moms are taking very slow steps because of the young ones as they walk into the woods. From the Aedes in the Mara to the Aedes in Juma, you can see that these guys are still having a little bit of a drink there. In fact, the one closest to us was falling asleep just now. Um, you can tell when they're falling asleep because their eyes start to close and their trunk becomes all relaxed and kind of flops on the ground. But it's not a really a great place for her to sleep because one is it's in the sun, which is getting viciously hot now. And two, it's right next to the commotion of all the others drinking and and arguing over water and so it's not a lot of room for a nap when you're that close to all that's going on. Shame girl, why don't you find a shady spot and then go and sleep there for a bit? Probably find her calf is drinking and so that's why she's just waiting. As soon as the calf is done then she'll probably move off a little bit. There we go. we go but the matriarch has now left she's had enough and her little calf also had enough they both have moved off and so that's why it's allowing everybody else to come in you can see it's a little bit more of a free-for-all now than it was earlier there's not as much pushing and shoving taking place everybody's kind of being allowed to have a little bit of a drink and they just take it in turns the trunks all kind of go in at once and then one drinks and then the other one drinks and slowly but surely everybody gets what they need um, now that they're not being pushed away at all. Poem parlors are still ever hopeful, but I'm afraid I don't think it's a great <laughs> situation for them. Benny, I, I think you and I and a lot of others enjoy watching Ellie's drink. It's fascinating insight into the hierarchies, particularly at pumped water holes. Um, 
time, but also just the, the anatomy of how they drink and the way that they do things. And generally, there's a lot of talking that takes place when they're at water holes. So you get really kind of nice audio as well as the visuals. And there's just something serene about the Ellie's at water that, that is enjoyable. You know, you just sit there and kind of watch them taking on water and they seem to be genuinely happy um, when they're around water holes so it's, it's nothing nothing not to enjoy that's for sure must be honest though after sitting on this mound for the last hour um, in the sun starting to get quite jealous about the fact that they're drinking water so I'm hoping that they will move off at some point so we can come down and try and find a bit more shade um, because it's starting to get very, very hot in the sun. Oh, sounds like a fun bushwalk. We have not seen even one elephant today. However, there are three yellow-billed storks standing very still at Ndlovu Dam. They were fishing just a minute ago, but then they got a fright. I'm not sure what uh, gave them a fright, and they flew straight out of the water. And now they're sort of just standing around, but maybe they'll make their way back in. It's always very fascinating to watch these birds use their various fishing techniques. And I'm sure it's going to get a lot easier for them now as this watering hole is drying up. But it's nice to sort of see them around. Now, these also are intra-African migrants, so they move around throughout Africa. But luckily for us in South Africa, there is a small population of uh, resident yellow-billed storks. So in some areas, you can see them throughout the entire year. But they're quite a large bird, too. They're much more robust than the heron species. Well, the grey heron that normally lives at this dam, and is not here anymore. It was here yesterday afternoon. It has now flown away. you can see it's oh so so dry at the moment but the weather is changing i know tristan was just talking about looking for some shade we haven't got any sun at the moment it's very gloomy out of a haze a thin layer of clouds but i don't think it'll take the sun too long before it burns them all away but i'm quite thankful for the overcast morning as i think the temperatures are going to be excruciating almost like yesterday probably the same as yesterday before the strong winds move in tomorrow so that should be a fun time on safari everyone's gonna have to tighten their hats birds you're gonna have to hold on to your feathers i don't think you'll be able to do much flying around tomorrow but unsuccessful fishing mission so that means that we'll just stand and rest now and conserve energy Megan, these birds are very cool. They are lovely to watch. I do prefer them when they're doing something, though. You know, standing around like this is, is nice. Even if they would just preen their feathers to give me something to talk about, it would be wonderful. But that does not seem to be the case today. But look at those big beaks. They're huge, aren't they? I mean, like, I'm trying to think how long those beaks actually are. Probably the, maybe almost the length of a ruler. Maybe about three centimeters. I'd I'm, of course, just taking a gamble here, but you know what's fantastic is technology, and I do have a bird app, so I'm going to very quickly hop onto my bird app and see if um, it tells me how long they, their beaks are. I don't know if it will. They normally give sort of wingspan and, and the weight of the bird and sometimes the, um, the, the length of the bird, whether they were going to talk about how long the beak is. I actually am not sure. I can't seem to find that information. I'll have to. But just, just by looking at it and comparing um, the rest of the size of its body. So in terms of its height, I would say just less than a meter. It's, it's not a small bird. Like I said, you can see, look how long those legs are. We're obviously about 80 meters, almost 100 meters away from these birds. They're right on the other side of Ndlovu Dam. But if they were up close and, you know, we had something nice to compare it to. But I would say maybe 20 centimeters, maybe just more than that, maybe just less, somewhere around there. But nice birds anyways. I think I might pop myself out here a little bit later in the morning and sit down on the ground and see if I can't get some low angle shots of these birds fishing. Mm. 
bad life is always something nice uh, to watch. And 20 centimeters, it's quite long feet. And water is life, as it is to those hippos, as it could be to some Egyptian geese also. see a pair there just swimming floating in the water as also it could be life to some zebras having a drink I think it was uh, Tristan Alia who was by a waterhole and he thought we may have so many animals coming for a drink it's exactly how things unfold out here in the African wilderness. See those Egyptian geese, how close they are to the hippos. Totally not related. They're moving to one hippo, <laughs> to the left. But I think the one, the lead in this pair has detoured. It's going maybe to swim right across between the two, and there's another one to the left, much bigger hippo. And I think to me it looks like a bull because a few minutes ago he just pooped in the water and he was splashing the pool like a propeller of a helicopter. It's very nice to see how peaceful things are here in this water hole. I've got to continue a few minutes watching the animals drinking and the Egyptian geese enjoying the swim. I don't quite know what we're looking at here. This cannot be comfortable in any way, shape, or form. And yet, she's gone all camera shy. We, we did have the most beautiful view into her eyes. I think she's trying to hide her face from the shade. But she's completely contorted her body and, in true Kalamba style, does not look comfortable. She's refusing to come down. I wonder if there's maybe more hyenas than I realized down in the Mulwati, but I can't see. But that's possible that there's maybe four or five hyenas and she's just avoiding. She could easily outrun them. And pull herself up the second tree where her second dinner is. But for some reason, I don't think she's going to do that. She's just going to remain in some uncomfortable position for now. And when it gets too hot, I imagine she will go back into the shade. And what that means is that we're going to get time to spend with her this afternoon. It means she'll be around if she's got two kills in two very different places. We're spending time with Kalamba almost daily now which is amazing because for a while, we didn't see her for long enough. Many of you are loving how she is sitting. I know it cannot be comfortable, really. I just think she's determined not to take her eyes off this kill. Now there's really not much left. There wasn't much left yesterday. I'm just surprised she came back to this one. I have a funny feeling she stole that kill from Falco just to get one up on the hyenas. <laughs> there is no way last night she could be hungry in any way, shape or form. But it's been such a wonderful morning. I am overjoyed that the hyena den was active, really. It was so nice to spend time with at least some of them, although Ribbon's pair were not there. They would have been inside sleeping. Still didn't get Heart's Cub to stay still enough for longer, but I'm still convinced we've definitely got one girl. So that's Corky with the female, Heart with one female. It's the other one that I'm struggling to determine. But I'll keep trying. I'll keep going back to the den every single day so that we can finally figure out what Heart's little ones are. Because it makes a difference to the clan, of course, whether you're male or female, you're either going to stay and contribute to the pool of females to make it a stronger clan, 
or you're going to disperse to another clan. I don't think Columba is going to show her face within the next 30 seconds, I'm afraid. So we will have to end with a beautiful view of her rear end. But it has came to that time where it's far too hot. It's time for Niels and I to get some breakfast and it's time to say goodbye. But thank you everyone for jumping on board. It's always a pleasure. Your comments and questions are much appreciated. Bye for now. This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised.